Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining Coach Menachem's program tonight. Thank you for being here with us on this special early Sunday night. We moved the clock back, and tonight's share is a special share. It's share 163. And again, I want to thank everybody um, for promoting it. I mean, the last few weeks have been very big programs. We've been getting a tremendous amount of feedback. And it's thank you to all the people that come every week. And I'm a and people, even if they can come, they, uh, they let people know about it, and they uh, post it on their statuses. And... Um, you know, it's a real growth uh, program, and uh, it's a a place to really, you know, get some clarity. You know, over the last few weeks, we discussed the Matzah of Energy Stroll and the different aspects. Tonight, we're really going to go to the core. We really want to get to the Muna Betachem part, the part that's, that's really the so that what we need now. So we brought in the best of the best, Rabbi, Sat Rabbi, 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 Rabbi David uh, Sutton over here, to really learn with us and to give us the chizik that we need to be internally strong. A lot of the questions we had, Menachem, was, how do I do it? I feel depressed. I feel this. So... So, you know, we, we, we talked about the problems, but now we're trying to bring the, some of the Yeshua here. So that's why we have a uh, Satan is here tonight. Again, if anybody wants to join, you can WhatsApp me at 848-525-0066. Again, that's 848-525-0066. And I will send you every Sunday the flyer. I will send you the replays. Or you can go to Menachem Bernfeld's website, menachembernfeld.com. Sign up for his email list, where he emails you every week all the shiurim, the replays, and all the goodies that come out of Coach Menachem. For the people that are watching this on YouTube, please click on the like button and the subscribe button. So when Menachem uploads the videos, you get known. Every week we upload the videos right away. And the Menachem works diligently hard on it. And we appreciate that. And being inspiring, you know, Kali Yisrael. And uh, the last few shirim, again, I'm bringing it up again because we really covered some real powerful topics. And they really they really went around the world. We got tremendous feedback. And uh, a lot of good things actually happened from them. I'll, I'll tell later, maybe during the share, some, something that happened also, something interesting. Again, let's start our first thanking the advertising sponsors, the Lakewood Scoop for promoting us here in Lakewood, Ellie and Ariel from Five Town Central, and Kyle Kaufman from JCM for promoting us on all the digital Jewish platforms. Again, if anybody's here the first time, where have you been? I don't know. But every Sunday night at 9.30 Eastern time now, we have tremendous shirim, we bring on different abundant, different therapists, different, we, we, had, we had it all. So we've had people, and uh, we're very thankful to keep on going and keep on being the Chazak Chazak together. It's a group effort. Metro Shem next week, November 12th, we're going to have a very deep session with the world-famous Mashpia, originally from Five Towns, with Rabbi Moshe Weimar, Rabbi Yossi Zakatinsky, Rabbi Joey Rosenfeld, who happened to move recently to Israel. And his topic is the redemption of trauma and the trauma of redemption. What Panimi Satari can teach us about chaos and fixing. So, as anybody who's listened to Rabbi Joey Rosenfeld, he's deep, very, very deep person, very into deep chasidus, and um, it's going to be a very powerful program. And uh, please join us, and uh, it should be amazing. And let everybody know about it. Tonight, we have the schuss and honor of having the world-famous author, David Sutton, with us tonight. Tonight's Shema trying to be mechazak, an important topic that everybody can relate to, and everybody needs clarity on, everybody has questions on. And uh, he, Baruch Hashem, graciously offers it to, to come and to spend his time and share some of the wisdom of the Beis Alevi over here with us and get some of those tools. We'll be able to maybe help thousands of people in tonight and the, the hundreds of thousands of people that will listen to the share around the world. And again, thank you for coming on. We're going to start our first with tonight's Gematria. Tonight, tonight is share 163. And we have the Rebbe over here with us, the CEO, the COO, all the C-levels. from Arne is going to give us the Gematria for 163. Everybody, Sutton, you'll tell us if it's a good Gematria, okay? Mm -hmm. As Hashem is number 163, Mastering Tranquility, Insights on the Teachings of Rav Yosef Dov, Salvation, the Shiva Velazhin, we were discussing the very important topic of, of Bitochen. As Hashem is Baruch, Bisiyat Dishmai, we came up with a very appropriate gematria for 163, is gematria Am Biteach Bashem, a nation that trusts and believes in the Ebishta, and as our hope throughout this year, we'll have a deeper understanding of Bitochen. And something which we could put impact in our everyday life. Amen. Beautiful, beautiful. beautiful. Very nice. Okay. So we got that. Rabbi Sutton approves. Baruch Hashem. Okay, so we're going to start off first with Coach Menachem. Coach Menachem, we're here Sunday night. We're gathered. Hundreds of people. And um, thank you for joining us. So why are we here, Menachem? What are we doing here tonight? Yeah. yeah. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone, to another Let's Get Real with Coach Menachem. Number 163, Baruch Hashem, with a lot of siyata, the Shmaya. And Hashem should give us kayf to continue. Hopefully, we only talk about positive things. You know, it's been a rough few weeks. And the topic tonight is very needed. Talking about a moon and betachin. They say one of the ways how a person connects 
to the Muna, to the Vitachin, is through challenges. And many times people go through a challenge and they're pushed to the corner and they tried everything and they're lost. And that's when they turn to Hashem. That's when they start, you know, there's nothing else that they can do. And uh, they do. They do connect. The question is how to get there. We shouldn't wait for being pushed into the corner. We shouldn't wait for those challenges. But now we're in a situation where Klal Yisrael is going through a challenge and many people are, many, many, many that weren't connected are, are coming back. They're, they want to show the world they're Jewish, not to be embarrassed because, you know, they push us uh, this way. We have to push the other way and we have to think, wait a second, what am I doing? I'm just a Jew, but what am I doing? So they start putting on film and tzitzis, which is amazing. But the question for many is there are many that do from the outside, we do the right things and we learn and we daven, we work and we have families, which is amazing. But the real the real question is how connected are we? You know, when when things work out, when Bar Hashem, we have Panasa, and Bar Hashem that they accept the kids in school, the kids uh, Bar Hashem behave, how connected are we? And that's really when we want to connect. We shouldn't wait for the challenges and then we have to take out the Tehillim and say, Hashem, what do you want from me? Which is amazing. We're not going to take that away. But we want to try to connect through a positive way. So it's a real good question, you know, how connected are we? And it's really how connected are we to ourselves? Where am I? What's my mission? What am I doing here? And these uh, sometimes can be heavy questions. And I know Rabbi Sutton put out a few books, especially the last one, which uh, which is called The Art of Being You. I guess we'll talk about it later, but it sounds like there's a lot of self-awareness, the stuff that I love talking about. But that's one of the places where things start, being aware of yourself, being aware of what am I doing? Why am I doing this? When I dive in, what am I thinking about? What's my, you know... Do I want to get out to go to work? Or I I really believe that everything is, is you know, in Hashem and I daven to Hashem. So it's a question that we're going to talk about tonight in Mitzvah Hashem. And then the million dollar question, Ishtadlus, do we have to do Ishtadlus? How much Ishtadlus? How do I know? So it's a big schos, Baruch Hashem, we're here with Rabbi David Sutton. In Mitzvah Hashem, we're going to discuss, we'll have a discussion and uh, everybody should be able to ask your questions. Many of you, I'm sure, are sitting there trying to figure things out. Tonight is the time to ask, and Amit Sashem will come out with, a, hopefully, a step-by-step how to gain, how to get that patachin that we need, Amit Sashem. Shkoyach. Shkoyach, beautiful opening. Okay, so let's get into it tonight. The shir is titled, Mastering Tranquility, Insights from the Teaching of Rav Yosef Doi Salvechik, Rosh Shiva Velazhin, Exploring Betachem Through the Wisdom of the Basel Levi's Teachings. I'm going to read Rabbi David's uh, bio, and then I'm going to give him the floor. Rabbi David Sutton is a rabbinical figure in the Syrian community in Flappish. He received guidance in Ashkafa and Musa from the famed Mashiach Shkiach of Shlema Volvi at Yeshiva Beis Yak- uh, Bir Yaakov. Additionally, he acquired his knowledge in Alocha from the Sephardic giant in Rosh Shiva Chacham Ben Sion Abashol. Alongside Reb David Azari, Aziri, he serves as a spiritual leader and a leader at the Yad Yosef Torah Center on Avenue J. Rabbi Sutton com- completed his training at the McLaren Hospital as an affiliate of the Harvard Medical School, specializing in clinical pas- pastoral education (CPE). He is also the founder and director of, of SIMA Sephardic Initiative and Mental Health Awareness, a Brooklyn-based health organization catering to the Sephardic community. Rabbi Sutton is the author of numerous books, including the latest bestsellers by Salavi on Bedachin. Basically, Levi and Havas Yitzchol, and a daily dose of betochen, and the art of being you. So it's a great success to have you here with us. Thank you, Rabbi Sutton, for giving us your Sunday night, and open it up. The floor is yours. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, as we said, uh, we're basing our lessons on the teachings of the Beis Halevi. Before we actually, we're not going to talk and quote from the Sefer, but an important introduction on why we have to work on betochen, especially now. Let's go back to. Shabbos Shuva. We really didn't have a chance to end the Teshuvah process because we started Rosh Chodesh Elul 
we went through Rosh Hashanah, Aseret Mei Teshuvah, Yom HaKippurim, and then the process continues till Shemini Atzeret, and usually, Simchat Torah, you dance, and then that's it. The guard is down, you go back to regular life. And this year, we really didn't have a chance to return back to regular life. Uh, there are many shuls in Eretz Yisrael and America as well that are still saying, Avinu Malkeinu. So it's not like uh, we ended the Teshuvah process. And on Shabbat Shuvah, we read from the Navi Oshea that says, Shuvah Yisrael ad Hashem alokecha, return Yisrael till Hashem your God, which means until Kisei HaKavod. Chulimechem devarim, take with yourself words, which means say vidui, do Teshuvah. And then in the fourth, pas the third Pasuk, Pasuk Dal, but the third Pasuk of this Haftarah, there's a strange line. Ashur lo yoshienu. The Assyrians won't save us. Al sus lo nirkav. We're not going to be riding on any horses. The lo nomar od elokenu lumaseyadenu. We're no longer going to say to our handiwork that it's our God. And it goes on and ends up saying that God is going to heal us and he's going to love us once again. And the Beit HaLevi, or Beis HaLevi, is bothered in his commentary on Breshit. What does this have to do with Teshuvah? I don't know if any of you ever were bothered by that question. Shabbat Shuvah was a famous famous Haftarah. I don't know, if Coach Menachem, if you ever gave a drush and a shul on Shabbat Shuvah. I'm not sure if, I don't know your bio, if you have a, a, a shul or anything. But this is a very powerful question. What are, what are we talking about horses for? I'm not going to ride any horses. What does that have to do with, with, with Shuvah? So the Beis Halevi asked this question, not in his, in his essay on Bitachon, but he asked this in Breshit. And he says that whenever you do tshuva, you have to go back to the source of the problem. And he says, if you don't get to the shortish, you don't get to the root, it's like you're cutting the weeds out, but you're not uprooting them, they're going to go back again. So you have to go to the beginning of the source of the problem, the source of the problem. And he says, the source of the problem then and his Sefer, he says the same thing, the source of most of our sins today comes from a lack of bitachon, a lack of reliance on Hashem. And that's why we end up doing what we're not supposed to be doing. If we really fully connect, like Coach Menachem said, and we realized how Hashem runs our lives and how He's with us at all times, most sins would not occur. And therefore, the Beis HaLevi says the first step to Teshuvah is we have to go back and say, Ashur lo yoshienu. They were relying on the Assyrian army. We have to, the first step to Chuvan, especially now, is where we, you know, every time, oh, wow, Biden said, uh, we, we back Israel. Yay, we can sit back and relax. Biden backs Israel. And the next day, someone else says something else, and then our heart drops, as if that anything's going to make a difference by what they say in Congress or wherever they say is going to make a difference. Ashur lo yoshienu. This is an age old problem. Ashur will not save us. Don't rely on any outside forces. And then it says, Al sus lo nirkav. We're not going to ride on a horse. What horse are we talking about? We're not going to ride on a horse. So, Rav Yehuda Satka, the late Rosh Yeshiva of Porat Yosef, brings us a story in the, from the prophet Yeshaya. At that time, Kiskia Melech had a very, very weak army. If you remember, Chizkiah Melech neglected the army and put all of his money into yeshivot. If you remember, the Gemara says they went from Dan to Beersheba and there wasn't a child that didn't know the laws of the most complex topics in Tarot. So he neglected the army. What happens? You can look this up in Yeshia Perak Lamedvav. Rav Shaker, who was a Jewish rebel, tells Tells makes a, a, an announcement, and he says, "Ma bitachon What are you guys having bitachon for? You think you're going to win the war? You're what are you relying on? You think you're relying on Hashem? That's going to help you?" And he makes the following line. He says, Ashur." You know what, King Ashur? I'll give you free two thousand horses. Your army is so neglected, you won't even be able to find people that know how to ride horses. So Rav Shaker, in the name of Sanchev, is taunting Melech Chizkiah. What are you going to do, Chizkiah? What are you, what are you promising these people, Bitachon? What happens? 
V'yitpalel chizkiyahu l'fnei Hashem. Chizkiyahu prays to Hashem. And he goes on and talks about Hashem's power. You are the God that created the heavens and the earth. Hatei Hashem was nechao shema. Tilt over your ears and listen. We use this in our prayers. Tekach Hashem anecha re'e. Open your eyes and see. And listen to how the Buyim are cursing us. And he says, well, because of Chizkiyah's total bitachon, what does Hashem say? Ashur is not going to enter the city. You're not going to shoot an arrow. You're not going to use a battering ram. They're going to be wiped out. I'm going to protect this city. And what happened that night? An angel of God went out and killed in the Assyrian army 185,000 dead without a bow being shot. And had this happened, it says, Big Dehem, Nishmatam. Their clothing was left and their souls was burnt out. And where did this all come from? This came from Chizkiah Melech's powerful bitachon. That's what brought it about because he, he put his efforts into, into increasing the Torah learning. And like we say, Ela barecha ve'ela basusim v'anachtu b'shem Hashem elokeinu naskir. They go with their chariots and their horses, and we fight with Shem Hashem. Now, of course, we are still going to be using uh, horses and chariots. We're not uh, fit to have an open miracle like that without any hishtadlut. But we have to understand at the end of the day, what's going to make things happen is our bitachon, our relying on HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And that's what we can do. We can do that. The Chazonish writes something very powerful. He says... That what is the most important thing to do in a time of trouble? Time of trouble, you pray to Hashem and you rely on Hashem. That's what to do in a time of trouble. Now, of course, you need hishtadlut as well. But he says that if a person does hishtadlut, but there's no prayer backing him, then the, then the hishtadlut won't be successful. He says, if you don't do the hishtadlut that you have to do, he says, let's say somebody's drowning and the person sits by and says, Tehillim, he's a murderer. You have to go, you have to go and save him. But he says, if the lifeguard is running to save the person and you have no ability, you don't know how to swim and you don't say to Helium, you're going to be held responsible because your lack of prayer and your lack of bitachon can make a difference. Right now, we're not on the front lines. We're not fighting. But what can we do? What can we do? We can do this fundamental teshuva of Shuvah Yisrael. What's the teshuva? Not necessarily a teshuva and a sin but a tishuva on the source of all of our problems. What's the source of all, all of our problems? The source of all of our sins is a lack of bitachon. If I really believed, I'd have a few extra minutes to learn. If I really believed, I wouldn't have to cut corners. If I really believed, I, would, I wouldn't cut somebody off when I'm, uh, I'm in track. If I really believed, I'd live a different life. And therefore, the first step to tishuva is the tishuva and bitachon. And the understanding of Ashur lo Yoshienu. The Assyrian army will not save us. Al sus lo nirkav. We're not riding on horses. We're not going to win the war. Rather, like we say in another one of the Haftarahs, the, it's actually the Haftarah for, for Hanukkah, we're going to read it, where it says, lo bachay the lo bakoa, not with an army and not with strength. Ki im beruchi amar Hashem sevol. It's with my spirit. It's with the, the spiritual forces that's going to make us win this war. And that's, we have to realize that we're doing something now. We're sitting here now, uh, 335 people. They changed the clock, so we'll pull 10 to 11 on your body clock. And you're staying up now. And what are you doing this for? Because we believe that we can make a difference. We believe a Kadosh Baruch who's watching and looking and knows and sees how involved we are and how much we care. And we're being more rachamim, we're arousing Hashem's mercy when he sees we're doing what we can do down here. And that's extremely important to understand this need at times like this for bitachon and to understand that when the, the, the importance to do teshuvah, it says when difficult times happen, you're supposed to do teshuvah. According to the Beit HaLevi, the most fundamental teshuvah is teshuvah and bitachon. So have in mind now, as we explore the topic of bitachon and try to understand it better, we are actually in middle of a tishuvah process. Because the better our bitachon is, the more connected we are 
the better we're going to do. Okay, beautiful. Thank you, Rabbi Sutton. I really appreciate that. Okay, we're going to take a poll. Anybody wants to ask a question, you have Rabbi Sutton here with us tonight. Let's hop around. Any question you have, he's here to answer it. Everything's on the table. Let's start with a poll. It's a three-question poll. Here we go. Very detailed questions. Let's see how the, let's see how you answer it. Answer honestly. First question: What, in your opinion, distinguishes between a moon and betachon? What is the difference? Is a moon and betachon? So, four possible answers. Number one, they're essentially the same thing. Number two, a moon pertains to belief in Hashem, irrespective to religious practice, while betachon specifically relates to like being the religious religious part. Number three, a moon is more theoretical, while betachon involves a practical component. Like a moon is like, I just believe betachon is actually like doing something practical. The fourth answer is Emunah significant 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 belief in Hashem's capability, while Batakan conveys the idea of actively relying on him. Those are the four options for the first question. The second question is it considered a waste of Batakan if I place my trust and belief in something specific, but it didn't ultimately receive what I desired? Somebody wanted somebody to get a Rafushalem or whatever it is, and you put a Batakan and Emunah and it didn't work out. So three possible answers. Yes, I wasted my time. Number two, no, it could still come to fruition. Or number three, you receive reward for betachon whether you achieve your desired outcome or not. Okay, and the four, the third and final question: When faced with a difficult challenge, what happens to your to your trust in Hashem? What happens to your moon betachon Hashem? Number one, it gets stronger. Number two, it gets weaker, and I become scared. Number three, it remains exactly the same as usual. Or number four, I really don't have betachon either way. Everybody answered the truth anonymously. We'll share the results with everybody. Only Rabbi Sutton, you can see what people are answering. And then I share it and everybody can see it. And then we'll go through it. And again, anybody has a question, can text Asher Parnas over here. Live questions go first. And um, let's really learn together. Let's bring Mashiach. Let's win the war. Rabbi Sutton, can we win the war tonight? Sure. We can wake up tomorrow morning with 180,000. Or something your like volume like goes in and out a little bit. So just I don't know if the mic or something, but if there's anything you can do about that, you know what I mean? Uh not really. Okay. It's about to talk up. Okay, so let's uh give it three more seconds. Everybody finish the polls and we're gonna share them and we're gonna get into it, okay? Three, two, one. Okay. So these are the results, Rabbi Sutton. In your opinion, what distinguishes between the moon and betachon? So only 1% of people say that it's the same thing. So everybody here basically feels two different things. Number two, 18% um, of people, a moon pertains to belief in Hashem, irrespective if you're from or not. While betachon specifically is about being religious, 18%. 16%, a moon is more theoretical, while betachon involves more practical component. And the fourth answer was 65% of people are saying is a moon signifies belief in Hashem's capabilities, while betachon conveys the idea of actively, of act, I can't even read the rest. Hold on. Of actively, how come I can't read the rest? I don't know. It gets, so it gets cut off, yeah. Okay, Reverend Sutton, so what do you say to the first question? Um, the first question, I think um, three and four are pretty close, but um, I, I, I really would vote for number four. And this is an important point um, that Bitachon is not something that's a passive uh, concept. It's not something that's just in your head. It's not intellectual bitachon. Bitachon is, uh, give to for, give an example, if um, I need to pay my mortgage and I don't have the uh, the ability to pay my, my mortgage uh, this month. So I happen to know that uh, I have a wealthy father. And I know that if I ask my father, he will uh, he'll help me. I know that. I know 100%. He has the money in the bank. And if I ask him, he'll give it to me. And uh, any my brother asks him, he gives it to me. I just didn't ask him yet. So my moon is 100% to my father. But I happen to have a job. And I'm working. And I'm proud. And I don't ask him for the money. I'm not relying on him. So I have a moon that my father could pay my, my mortgage. Now, if for some reason this month I have a wedding to make. And I can't cover my mortgage. And now I call my father on the phone and say, Dad. I think I need you this month for the morgue. And he says, don't worry, I'll handle it. Then I'm relying on my father. It's an active concept. So that's why Bitochon, I like to say a lot, Bitochon is not a bumper sticker. 
It's not just, okay, everything's going to be okay. It's, it's not that. It's reliance. That's why we use the word mish'an umiftach latzadikim. What does the word mish'an mean, Rabbi Parnas? What does mish'an mean? A mish'an. It's a belief in the tzadikim. What's a mish'an? What's what translates the word mish'an, a mish'an? Menachem knows the tash. On a stick. Mish'an is a cane, right, a cane. So a mishan is a cane, a mishan is. So mishan means something that you lean on. When you walk with a cane, if you take away the cane, you're going to fall down. So bitachon means I'm literally leaning on a kaddish baruch Hu. I'm leaning on him. I, if, he, if he's not there, I'm falling down. I'm relying on him. I'm leaning on him. It's not just something in my mind. I'm fully giving myself over. I'm relying on him. I need him to do it. I'm not relying on anybody else. I'm counting on him. That's bitachon. That's why the Chavos Lava says that one of the reasons why people people say, well, I had bitachon, why did it happen? And he says, because if you rely on multiple people, then you're not really relying. Relying means I call you up and I say, I need to get to the airport. I need to get to the airport. My flight's leaving. Can you please pick me up? I'm relying on you. Okay, I'm relying on you. If I tell you, by the way, I also called Uber to pick me up. I can't rely on you anymore because I have someone else to count on. Bitachon means I am relying on a Kaddish Baruch Hu, nobody else. And that's not something that does mean I know he can do it. It's much more than I know. It's a reliance. I hope I'm giving over the point, but that's what Bitachon means, to rely on a Kaddish Baruch Hu, to count on him, to lean on him. Okay, number that's two. Fine. Is it considered a waste of Bitachon if I place my trust in something specific? but it didn't ultimately receive what I desired. So only 2% of people say yes, 15% of people say no, and 83% of people say you receive the reward for talking whether you achieve your desired outcome or not. Beautiful. So 80%, they really, these people over here really don't need a shear. They, they seem to know everything already. No, if you come to Coach Renachem, you're, you're, you're solid, you're solid. Okay, okay. I don't know if there's an admission process or something. You have to take a test before you get No, on it just takes a few months of coming consistently, and then you you you, you, you get on the bandwagon. That's it. Uh-huh. So Rabbaniyana says something fascinating in Mishle. He says, listen to this tremendous Rabbaniyana. He says, and Beis Alevi says in his Sefer as well, that besides Bitachon being a way to get what you want, Bitachon is a mitzvah. And you get the Schar mitzvah. And Schar mitzvah is Baha'i Amalek. That means the reward for your Bitachon is not in this world. The fact that you get what you want, that's a side that's a side benefit. That's not the main benefit. The main benefit is in Olam Haba. And he says another big Kiddush. He says, let's use an example. I live in Brooklyn, and it's hard to get parking. Okay? Parking is difficult in Brooklyn. So you're driving on uh, Coney Island Avenue, and you want to get a parking spot. So you say, I'm relying on Hashem. Please, Hashem, give me a parking spot. Sure enough, someone pulls out, and you get a spot. Great. So you got the spot. What happens if you said, I'm relying on Hashem to get a spot, and I didn't get the spot? I didn't get the spot. And I ended up uh, parking three blocks away. Okay. Why that happened? I'll leave it for now. But I didn't get my spot. Now, what's a spot worth? I could have parked by the pump and get a $150 ticket. So I'll say the spot is worth $150. Says Rabaniana, guaranteed the schar that you get for the mitzvah of bitachon is more than the item that you wanted to get to be anyway. That means whether you get what you wanted or not, you're ready ahead of the game. Because the schar and Olam Haba for the Bitachon is more than the $150 ticket. So you're, you're, you're always ahead. You're never losing out by having Bitachon because there's a reward for Bitachon. So it's a, it's a, great, it's a great thing. It's, it's, never, it's never a waste of energy or time or effort. You're getting paid for Bitachon. So what's the difference if you get what you want, you don't get what you want? Well, that's a separate discussion of why you didn't get what you want. But bottom line is you're getting paid anyway. So, you know, what do I care if, if, if I, if, uh, you know, at the side point, I do get the parking spot. I don't get the parking spot. I'm ahead of the game already by the fact that I'm getting rewarded for the mitzvah bitach. Okay, when faced with a difficult challenge, what happens to you trust in Hashem? Most people here say 67% of the people say it gets stronger. 21% say it gets weaker and I become scared. 10% say it remains exactly the same as usual. And 2% of the people say I really don't have a talking either way. There's no right answer over here. You're asking what what the people's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What their reaction is. There's no one right answer. You know, it, it, some people do get weaker when they have a challenge. Some people do get stronger. Some people do stay the same. And there are people that didn't be talking to begin with. So uh, all answers are correct for that one. I don't think there's okay. uh, one. Right Robert Sutton, let's get into it again. Anybody wants to ask a question, please text us your partners. It's a lot of questions that I'm going to be talking. We really want to get clarity here. Um, so 
We have the first live question. Let's go. You're on. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, I would like to know what's the Torah's perspective um, on pain? Like sometimes it can be very overwhelming and especially when it's like a situation that's like not your fault, like someone passed away or something like that. What I tell myself now is that Hashem put, a, put me exactly where he wants me to be. And everything that happens in my life is measured by Hashem. And my question is not really um, why do good people suffer? That's not my question. It's more like, what is the view that, like, what's the perspective that I should have on this when viewing pain? So that's a, that's, that is a difficult question. You know, pain is painful. You know, pain is painful and, and, and nobody wants to be in pain. And it doesn't seem to really serve a purpose when you're in pain. And um, one of the most difficult things in life is not finding meaning and purpose in what you're doing. We always want to have a meaning and a purpose in what we're doing. And living in pain doesn't seem to have a purpose. So I want to share two interesting things with you. One of them is, Bavolba writes on a, um, there's a Gemara that says, um, let me see the exact words, if I could bring them out. It says, um, Those that are disgraced and don't disgrace back. They're happy with the These people that are insulted and hold it back, they are suffering and they, and they continue. They're 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 in pain and they're smechem biyisurim. They're like the sun, the sun that is shining. And Revolva says the sun shining, that's an indication of a tremendous power, tremendous energy. One would think that a person who's suffering, we would say he's okay, he's he's a nebuch, but the term he's shining like the sun means that he's bringing himself out to full his full potential. And he says that there's a chiddush here, that we look at people that are in a situation of suffering like they're not doing anything. He says it's possible that the person that is accepting and tolerating Yusurim is more active than the biggest Askin because when he has that strength, that gavura, to be able to continue on and live his life with that pain to be able to live a life of suffering and, and not to be broken and stay strong, that person is the true strong person. He's shining like, like the sun. So to, to understand that when a person is sitting in bed uh, because he's suffering, he's not he's not, not doing anything. Um, actually, I'm, I'm, as I'm talking, I'm trying to flip through. I happen to have the Ali Shur on my table here. And he says, Someone that's suffering pain. The people look at him as like he's Rachmanus. No one's going to look at him as he has a gibar. He says it's possible. The man that sovel and holds it. He says, but you have to realize that a person that is no se osam besimcha, that holds his pain and suffering with happiness, the eno nishbar mehem baruchon doesn't get broken, hu hu ha gadol shebegadolim. He is the greatest of the great. So that's an unbelievable uh, Torah perspective on Yusurim, to, to appreciate and understand how great a person is when he stays strong and unbroken in the, in the face of suffering. The um, there's actually Masil Shisharim. The Masil Shisharim uh, is talking about uh, the, the, how, to, how, to, how to love Hashem. And he says the biggest challenge to loving Hashem is having uh, difficulties in life. That's one of the biggest challenges to, to be tough and having those difficulties in life. And now he says, uh, how, do I, how do I get over that? So he says there's two approaches. There's the simpler approach and there's the higher level. The simple approach is, like, like this young lady said a moment ago, everything that Hashem does is good. I don't understand why it's good. 
But for some reason, it's good. That's the simpler level. He says the higher level, he says, is a person that says, I'm going to show Hashem that I, regardless of all the challenges that he brings upon me, I'm going to keep on serving him. He gives a muscle to a general that's fighting in a war. He doesn't want an easy war. Or Shmuel Birnbaum gives a muscle. Someone that's mountain climbing. He doesn't want to have an easy mountain. Someone that's skiing. He doesn't want to go down the beginner's course. He wants to show his strength. You have, you have uh, uh, Coach Menachem has all the great therapists on here. The great therapists, they don't want simple cases. They want the complicated cases. Because what's the big deal? You give me a simple case. The great surgeons, the great um, uh, obstetricians, they want the high-risk cases. Don't give me the easy stuff. I want to show my abilities. And the Misil Shisharm that says true greatness is the person that's able to stay strong when things are tough. And he doesn't know why it's, it's happening. But he says, I'm going to show the world how I push through these painful situations. I'm not broken. And that's going to show, Hashem's going to look down and say, wow, look at this person. Look at what they're going through. And even with this, they're saying, staying strong. The, the tremendous impact of the mother of that hostage, that before her daughter was free, the first soldier to be freed, she was taking Hadulina Frasha's Kala, and she said on the, she said, I love you, Hashem, in the middle of that. And people from the outside were saying, it was a Knesset member, they got up and spoke about her and says, I'm jealous of her gvura. I'm jealous of her strength. Here, this simple woman going through such challenges and in such pain and suffering, her child is held hostage and she can still have that connection and feeling for our Kaddish Baruch Hu. I'm jealous of her gvura. So people that are suffering and still stay strong, the Torah looks at it as true gvur, true strength. And that person has to realize their strength. And the, the world might not be celebrating them, but they have to know what this Revolva says based on the Gemara, that their kitsay Hashem is the gvurasa. Wow, beautiful, Rabbi Sutton. Powerful. Okay, let's go to the next live question. Unmute. Okay, hi. Hi, Rabbi Sutton. Uh, thank you for being with us tonight. So I have two questions, which is really kind of the same source. Um, first of all, how do we like differentiate between bitachin and like these wishful, good hope thinkings? Like we just think positively, but mm, great it's question. like fluffy in the air. Beautiful. And secondly, there is like the the best example you gave was this, with the uh, with the parking spot. It's like. I, you know, when I try to go find parking, like, I want to start having bitachon, but then there's doubt, like, and the doubt I feel it comes like, come on, every time I have to get a parking, like, I have to be a super tzaddik. So we want to kind of like defend Hashem, like, okay, so if I don't get a parking, it's okay. So then doubt starts to come kick in. Uh, maybe we won't find the parking spot. It's like, okay, so then the whole reliance uh, falls away. So what is the proper way a person supposed to go, you know, rely, but like, oh, what if it doesn't happen? Like, you know, with that doubt. And I guess it's a little connected to like, what's real bitachon and what's, you know, positive thinking and just wishful thinking that things will go good. Right. So I have to have a, um, this book in my hand called uh, Beis Halevi on Bitachon. I heard and, that uh, word the author is a very good author. No, what's his name? Beis Halevi, his picture <laughs> on the front cover. So in there, it's like, Rabbi uh, Sutton, you, you know, you said the park, but you didn't say the joke. You have to say the joke. Yeah, that's the joke. Oh, because the guy's looking for a parking place. Hashem, please help me find the parking yeah. spot. He's driving around, driving around. Finally gets the parking place. He says, okay, Hashem, I'm good now. I found one. That's okay. Good, good. So on page 70, we have a nice little uh, note over here. Of Chaim Friedlander. In his Sif Se Chaim, Midas Vavodas Hashem, page 538, notes that Bitochen base hope should never be confused with baseless optimism. Simply hoping for the best without bitachon is not connected to Hashem. Even an atheist who purchases a lottery ticket hopes that he will win. So I, I know that line of think good and will be good is attributed to a lot of great people, but think good and will be good doesn't say Hashem's name in it. And Rav Deslo has a whole piece in one of his farm, not in Mechtam Leo, it's a safer put out later, from Vaden that he gave in London or something. I bought it recently. And he has a whole two or three pages saying that there's just certain people are optimistic. Optimism is not bitachon. 
optimism is just a, uh, a nature. Everything's going to be good. There are optimistic people, there are pessimistic people. It has nothing to do with bitachon. Bitachon means relying on Hashem. Uh, it has nothing to do with being a tzaddik, you know, and, and to really believe that, you know, who, who's giving you, the, yes, Hashem is giving you that spot. Rabbi Yonah writes that people um, have bitachon on the big things, like, okay, I'm getting on a plane, I'm having a heart surgery. Uh, Asher Yatsar is, in the, you know, every every simple uh, you know, oh, bodily function is is a heart surgery. You know, if you have said when you come out of, after after using the facilities, you just feel like you just came out of a surgery. It's a surgery just because it's a small thing. Does it? The parking spot is 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 major, and it's not a small thing. And it's not like let's like say oh, every time I need a parking spot, I need me to be a tzaddik. It's like you know, saying every time I have a heart surgery, I need to be a tzaddik. There's no difference. Yes, if if Hashem doesn't want you to get the spot, you're not getting that spot. You know, one hundred percent need him. And he's involved, he's watching you, and he's he's there. So, you know, he's pumping energy into your arm as you turn the wheel to, to, to park in the spot. He's not just finding you the spot. He's parking for you in the spot. He's doing everything there. There's nothing that's happening on your own. The, that's the, the the whole Torah Devara talks about how HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the tremendous Melech, uh, El, uh, Melech that Sovel, tremendous disgrace, that there's nothing that we do that he's not pumping the energy into us to do it. So it's not it's not being a tzaddik when you uh, invoke Hashem in your parking spot and you don't have to start doubting because uh, he's there anyway. And for whatever reason, it doesn't work. Again, we're not going to get into why someone relies on Hashem and it doesn't come through. If that's possible, it's not possible. That's not for this question. But uh, 100% uh, uh, do not uh, confuse pessimism, optimism, and bitachon. Bitachon is needs Hakadosh Baruch Hu, and he's there, and you have to uh, bring him into your life because he's there anyway. So, if you don't mind, if I just follow up, how do we deal with that feeling of rejection? So, oh, I didn't get the parking spot. So, and next time we want to again have Bitachon. What is the at that moment? How, how are we supposed to take it? Um, this is really a, a separate, long discussion. And again, I don't want to get into you. It's not a rejection. I mean, maybe like you said, you were doubting. You didn't really have bitachon. You were, you were, you were, you were, you were hedging it. You know, so uh, it's 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 hard to. Uh, there's a there's a pasuk when it talks about bitachon that that Hashem knows your heart. Bitachon's in the heart, so it's very hard to you know to say that you know you rely on Hashem and it didn't work. Did you really rely on Hashem? Were you doubting? So how are you supposed to feel? You're supposed to feel that you got rewarded for trying. You're definitely ahead of the game because you had bitachon. Hashem is proud of you that you had to be tough on And for whatever reason, it didn't, you didn't get it. You didn't get it. That's, that's getting it is really the side thing. That's really not the, that, that's not the main focus. The focus is you, you connected to Hashem. You, you, you relied on him. And uh, that's it. Getting your, uh, Ravolba writes about tefillah, but it's on bitach. And he says, really, we shouldn't even have this whole tefillah bitach on process. Hashem knows what's good for me. He'll give me what's good for me. What do I need that for? The answer is, it's it's what what you're going through, the connection that you're having. It's not about getting the parking spot. This is all this is all a game. It's really a game where they're playing with you. The whole thing's a game. It's not about the parking spot. It's about giving you an opportunity. It's like an obstacle course. It's not about the parking spot. These are all what we call in the Hebrew hechatimsis. It's just an opportunity to get you to think and connect. So whether you got the spot or didn't get the spot, that's really not the issue. A lot of people live with the concept of I'm going to have Bitochen because I want it. It's like, and if I have Bitochen, it's going to happen. There, there is truth to that. There is truth to that. That that's 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 there's that's a separate discussion. Whether whether that, whether you're on the level or not for that, again, that's a separate question. But you're always ahead of the game. The focus shouldn't be on getting what you want. That's really like the carrot. That's not that's not the main the main focus. That's like we all know the the the, the um, the Medrash that says that um, after Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, the HaKadosh Baruch Hu made the, the Paro chase after, after the Klal Yisrael. And it gives the mushal of the king that um, married, the, saw the princess being beaten up, saw this young lady being beaten up by, uh, by bandits. And, he, and she's screaming for help and he saves her. And then uh, and he marries her. And a year later, she gets into an argument with him and she's not talking to him. So what does he do? He goes and he uh, sends the bandits out again and she starts screaming. And then it says, Hashemini is kolech. 
I want to hear your voice. So the, the HaKadosh Baruch is looking to hear our voices. That's that's the main point. So he does these things to hear our voice. But the the the, the, the Tachlis, I think Rabbi Rucham Lovavit says, he doesn't might say exactly like this, but it's not that you have a headache, so you daven to Hashem to get rid of your headache. But the main Tachlis was to get rid of the headache. No, the Tachlis was to get you to daven to Hashem. The headache was the means. The Tachlis was 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 the was the connection. Is that one of my favorite stories? Is a story that I heard from a Navarica. I never saw it printed. I never saw it again. And this is the story. During World War One, I, I think it was, they were hiding in the forest. They hadn't eaten for an entire day. Yeshiva Navarica was in the forest. They hadn't eaten for an entire day. So they're davening with tremendous, tremendous kavana. And they go to sleep at night. And they still didn't get there. They didn't get anything to eat. They get up the next morning. They daven chakras. It's already the second day of Yom Kippur. They daven mincha mamish, screaming, davening. On the second day of fasting, as the sun's setting, there's a, a caravan full of potatoes that's coming down the road. It hits a bump in the road and some sacks of potatoes fall down. They wait for the sun to set. They bring the potatoes into the forest. And they make potato soup. And everyone has potato soup and they're eating. And the mire was not with the same fire as the previous mincha was. And the altar of, of, of Nevada gets up and says, we gave up our connection for a bag of potatoes. The tachlis is the connection. So you gave it up for a bag of potatoes. That, 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 that's what the whole thing was about. It's not about the bag of potatoes. It's not about the parking spot. Valdek, Valdek, very powerful. Okay, you're on. Hello. Who's 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 uh, in question now? Laura, Laura, Laura. Can you hear me? So I'm muted. Give one second. Can you hear? Can you speak? No, nope. she's texting me. Give her one more second, and we'll go to the next. Oh, there she is. I see her, but I can't hear you. Can't hear you. One second. Give her a second. Meanwhile, I'll, I'll mention that maybe that's why we, we say to thank Hashem. If He wants to hear our voice, is after Hashem helps things work out, we should be t constantly talking to Him and thanking. And that's what helps us connect and be connected. Why wait till we, we're in a place where, um, you know. 100%. 100%. That, that is, uh, Nisila Shram says, that's human nature. Most people, uh, they're only, uh, you know, the famous uh, story of the, um, the fellow gets uh, stuck on the roof of the bank. You know that story? Okay. Okay, um, okay, maybe I'm saying it wrong. So the guy goes to the bank and he takes out, you know, uh, he's getting ready for perm and he takes out uh, a few bags of, uh, of, of uh, dollar coins and he goes onto the roof of the bank. Afterwards, he wants to air out a little bit. He doesn't realize the door closes automatically. He's locked on the top of the roof now. He wants to get out. And he's yelling from the roof, yelling, 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 yelling. Nobody, nobody looks up, says, okay, I'll, I'll get their attention. He starts throwing the coins down. So that's throwing the coins down. And people start bending down to pick up the coins. Still right and no one's looking. He doesn't know what to do. He runs out of coins. He starts to take some gravel from the roof. He starts throwing the gravel down. People will get hit on the head with the gravel. Look up, who's this nut that's throwing the gravel? And guy, no, they realize the guy's stuck on the roof. They let him out. As long as you're throwing the coins down, no one's picking up their heads. They only yeah. pick up their head when the gravel comes down. Same thing with the Abish. He's throwing coins down all day. We just keep picking up the coins. No one's asking any questions. No connection. But when the gravel starts hitting you on the head, then everybody starts looking up who's throwing the gravel down. Uh, I once heard uh, uh, a rabbi said over, you know, sometimes you go out at these uh, irreligious funerals, you know, and uh, you know everyone's wearing their yarmulke. You know, by the weddings, by the chasen, there's no day, which isn't there. But when something goes wrong, suddenly, you know, they put the yarmulke on. So for some reason, we... we uh, Human nature is we connect when things go wrong, but of course the best way to do is with the thank yous. That's the best uh, the best conversation. Okay, let's go to the next live question. You're on. 
Hi. How do you keep up your bitachon during Shiduchim if you're an older single? That is a difficult question. Like any person that is trying and keeps on relying and it doesn't get what they want. So it's interesting that David HaMelech actually spoke about it because it says, Kave El Hashem, Chazek V'yametz Lubecha, the Kave El Hashem, hope to Hashem, strengthen and make your heart more courageous and hope to Hashem. That means that there are certain situations where you hope and it didn't come through and you have to be mechazek yourself again and continue to hope. And it's difficult because it's really, it's, it's, it's what we call in the modern term, you need to be, it's resilience to be able to keep on pushing and keep on relying as many times as it takes, even though you didn't get what you wanted yet. And believing that obviously, you know, yesterday was yesterday and uh, today is a new day. And with, with Hashem's hope, the, 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 the right time will come. We don't always know why things are delayed. And it's definitely difficult and challenging. But to, to remember what we started off with, that there is the harder it is. agra, The more difficult something is, the greater the reward is. And the same goes on Bitachon. It's much harder to have bitachon if so many times you relied and it didn't come through yet. But you have to believe that with that, because it's so difficult and so hard, the the reward is going to be that much greater. And you have to appreciate that reward. That's you, you're not wasting your time. And for some reason, Hashem is giving this opportunity of challenge to to grow from. It's definitely a difficult, uh, challenging thing, and and it's not. Uh, it's not 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 easy, and then no one's going to say it's easy. But, is uh, is the betachin that it's going to happen, or like you mentioned in the beginning, they have to turn it's it's painful. They have to turn their pain into saying, you know, the higher level that you mentioned, that I'm going to keep on serving even though it's so painful. That that's while they're going through it. But again, like I said, tomorrow's another day. I mean, they could definitely have betachin. You know, now that it's it's painful now, but. We're still at the same time hoping that uh, it's going to turn around and there's greater things in the future. We don't have to believe that we're destined to to, to have uh, everlasting misery. If it's possible, they can not remember what happened yesterday. And today is like, I'm starting dating today. Yes. It, it'll, it would be easier, but yes. that's a hard one. Yes. Yes. Here, I have a sudden, a lot of questions. A lot of people have a lot of questions. Let's go to the next one. You're on. Hey, thank you everyone so much, whoever's involved in all this. It's, it's really tremendous. My question is about Hishtadlus, because um, I would imagine that Hishtadlus is the equivalent of what you said, like calling an Uber. Right. So that's why it's an important word, is what are you relying on? If you call the Uber, but you're relying on Hashem, then that's not a lack of bitachon. You need to do your hishtadlis to cover the miracle. So hishtadlis is what you're doing externally. Are you relying on the Uber driver or are you relying on Hashem? So it's not a stira. We're not, you, know, you can't just stand outside and say, okay, I'm going to get to the airport. I'm just going to get there. Uh, but at the same time, when you are calling whoever you're calling, who are you relying on? Are you relying on the Uber driver? You know, uh, I recently called an Uber driver in Lakewood to come to Brooklyn, and they drove one block, and they told my son to get out of the car because they didn't realize he was going to Brooklyn. So, you know, you can call the Uber driver. It's not going to do anything for you. You have to rely on Hashem with the Uber driver. Uber drivers are not guaranteed. So, Hishtadlis is one thing, but and Bitachan is not a steer to Hishtadlis. It's what what are you thinking you can't, when you're doing the Hishtadlis? So the shtadlis is my effort, and bitachon is that none of the results that happen because of my effort are because of my effort. Not they right, are because not Hashem right. is gifting me, or not so, or shadokhim, or whatever. You're to the point that I'm sure everyone's familiar with the story with the chazonish, where he had uh, sent a bacher to go collect money, and he uh, wasn't successful. And a few days later, somebody came in unannounced, and brought in a large check. And the Chazonish called this boy in and said, I want to thank you. He says, thank me. What do you want to thank me for? I didn't collect any money. He said, no, you did Ishtadlus. So the Ishtadlus brings, brings, uh, brings the bracha. 
How do you have to do Hishtadlis? Just because your Hishtadlis didn't directly bring it, but the Hishtadlis doesn't make it happen anyway. You have to do your Hishtadlis, and then Hashem comes through. It doesn't always come through directly from the Hishtadlis that you did. So how do you know when it's too much Hishtadlis or not enough? Uh, that's that's another great question. Um, th there's w one or two answers. The simple answer is you need to do enough Hishtadlis to cover the miracle. That's the simple answer. Uh, the Beis HaLevi actually goes with that. You need enough Hishtadlis to cover the miracle. As long as it doesn't seem like an open miracle, you're fine. So that's there's no rule. You know, that's with Yosef HaTzadik. He was held responsible because he said, remember me, he said it twice. The Beis HaLevi discusses as well. The second time was a problem because you only have to ask him once. You don't have to ask him twice. It's too much Ishtadlis. If he's going to remember you, he'll remember you with one time. You don't have to call him a second time. Um, that's one answer. The second answer is given by Rav David Salavechik, and he says that Ishtadlis is just a way to help you with your bitacha, meaning it's hard to have bitacha. So you need to have like a, he, he calls it almost like, a, it's almost like a, an anxiety pill. That in order to, 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 you know, make it easier to rely on Hashem, you do Ishtadlis. So do enough that you're now able to rely on Hashem. If you feel calm enough to rely on Hashem now, that's enough. Some people have to work from 9 to 5 to be able to rely on Hashem. Some people have to say, okay, I'll go to work at 10 and I feel comfortable relying on Hashem. Whatever works for you and makes you comfortable and you now feel reliant on Hashem, that's what you need to do. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So let's get to There's a bunch of live, but I want to get to some questions that we really should cover. So we see that the talking is sometimes something we must work on, like, you know, or is it something like it's a success? Is, is it a mitzvah or is it something like it's a good a suggestion? Does the Torah specifically talk about the mitzvah of the Sometimes I feel like I don't have enough the Muna, especially when I need it. Can you explain the difference between somebody who really has the and somebody who doesn't have the quality yet? I mean, we covered a little bit of that, but is it a mitzvah? Or would the Torah talk about question. it? Right. The mm -hmm. first question, the first point you brought up is an important point. That many people, this is actually the opening words of the Beis HaLevi. Again, I'll take out my uh, handy little copy here and quote the first line, where he writes, second, he writes, Cholvas HaBitachon, the responsibility of Bitachon, Bob Psukim Harbe, comes in many Psukim, Umishim HaChaserbo, and someone lacking in it, Avera B'dolahi, it's a great sin. So people sometimes think, oh, be talking, you know, like we'll go back to the parking spot guy. Uh, I think I forgot Jacob, the parking spot man. You know, do I have to be at Sadiq every single time? I mean, I mean uh, yes. If you need a parking spot, there's a mitzvah in the Torah to rely on Hashem for the parking spot. And if you don't do it, and you need the spot, then uh, it's lacking, not just lacking. His words are very good. Be talking is, is, is not something that's an option. It's like, okay, if I'd like to have be talking, I could, and if I don't want to, I'll leave it to my own, you know, my own work. It's a mistake. Bitachon is a mitzvah. What the mitzvah is, that's another good question. Where does it say in the Torah, thou shalt rely on me? That's a, that's a, a good question. Where does it say? I want to know. I want to say malashem yichud before, you know, before I have bitachon. I want to be able to quote the Pasuk. Where does it say that? So uh, if anyone's interested, we'll give you that answer. But uh, right now, Shalom Gruzin. Bruce and Swag is uh, asking, wants to ask a question. Okay, let's go to the one who couldn't speak before. Let's get her on. Hi, how are you? Okay, hi, thank you. Uh, here, I'm going to put my, there we go. So um, thank you so much for taking my question. And um, here, I'm going to try to do this. Here we go, here I am. Just one, just one. Um, <laughs> just one, just one. Okay, it's fine, it's um, fine, it's fine. Yeah, we'll make that one go away. So my question is, thank you for taking my call. Um, we'll be a little doubled upright for the moment. So the question is, because of the war that's going on, uh, I have a, a bit of a question. So I'm not an activist. I'm not somebody who's going to do major organizing. You know, I do the bit I can with Tzedakah and Tefillah, but it feels like everybody has an advice every time, every WhatsApp chat I'm on, there's some rabbi giving advice on what I'm supposed to do to strengthen my betachon. I'm supposed to be dressing more sinias. I'm supposed to be saying certain tehillim. I'm supposed to be saying these certain korbanos. I'm supposed to be 
um, taking in Shabbos early. And I'm kind of wondering how to sort through it all and where really I should be, you know, like, like, how do you, how do I figure out where to put my energy to really um, strengthen my betachon in the service of helping Kali Yisrael at this difficult time? Okay, that's that's an interesting question, but I, I'm I'm not sure I fully understand your question because lighting, doing candles early, and dressing sneeze is not really on the bittachon problem. That's more like you know something to do to change yourself and fix yourself. So I'm not sure if you're asking a bittachon question. Or you just want to know like what should you fix in yourself? How do I know what to do? To, how to change myself and better myself, improve myself? Question. Well, it well I I guess I think of bittachon. I mean, I know there's the tough one in terms of actually in the moment having solid trust in a Kosh Baruch Hu. But the, so the question is, what would be helpful for all this advice? What's helpful to do to strengthen my relationship with Hashem as an individual yid who's part of the call, right? So trying to elevate myself as part of Kal Yisrael in order to bring merit for Kal Yisrael. How do I strengthen my relationship with Hashem when everybody's got advice on how I should be going about doing that? Okay, so I, I, again, I, I don't. I'll, I'll answer the question. I don't. I don't really see it as a fully betachon question. But uh, many years ago, I once asked uh, Rabbi Huda Adas, who's one of my rebbe's, uh, there was a person that was going through a difficult challenge. And he wanted to know what he should do, and his answer was a great answer: is, "How do I know what you should do? You know yourself. Look into yourself." And it's interesting. There's Rav Shach says an unbelievable thought, and it's a it's a sifarno as well. The, the Gemara says that at the time of the Churban, Churban bias, they asked the Chachamim, why was the Beis HaMix destroyed? They didn't know. They asked the Nebiyim, they didn't know. They asked the Malach and the angels, they didn't know. Until they asked HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself, and he said why the Beis HaMix was destroyed. You know with that, Gemara coach? Yes? Yeah. <laughs> so, ask Rav Shach a bomb kasha. He says, if the rabbis don't know, it's interesting. The rabbis in the time of the Corbin didn't know. The rabbis don't know. The prophets don't know. The angels don't know. So what do you want from the people? And if Shach says, you see from there that deep down you know what you should do. You know what you should do. So you don't need anyone else to tell you what to do. Take out some time. Sit in a room. Think about it. And ask Hashem, open my eyes. But it's your job. It's no one else's. It's not It's not the WhatsApp prophet that's going to tell you what to do. I do want to add that many people feel after they have taken Shabbos or Sneeze or whatever it is, they still feel guilty that they could do so much more. So the truth is, you know, we're, we're not, we can't be perfect. There's always going to be more that you can do. So we have to remember that whatever you're doing, first realize, okay, I'm doing something more. Now realize... That's amazing. You know, take it as a positive. Take it that you, this is my part and this is what I'm doing and I feel great. Now, after a while, if you want to add, that's fine. But if you constantly feel I'm not doing enough, I'm not doing enough, feel guilty, guilty, that's not going to take you to the right place. There's an interesting, again, this is not the, what the purpose of this class is, but it's an important point. Coach Menachem brought it up. There's a not well known uh, in Nefesh Hachaim. Is the, there's the uh, regular Sharm, and there's a section right before Shar Dalad where he has some interesting advice there. And he brings down the pasuk that says Kol Yetzer Leib Machshavas Adam Rak Ra Kol Hayom, which simply means that the the people are thinking to do bad all day. That was by the Dar Mabel. He says that's not what it means. He says the Yetzahara is telling you all day you're no good. Mm. That's the Yetzer to say, rock, rock, you're only doing bad. And that's what Coach Menach was bringing up. He was afraid that, you know, don't start feeling guilty now and overwhelmed that, you know, that's that's also could be the eight Sahara that's trying to get involved. Okay, I hope that was sufficient of an answer. Okay. Okay, let's go to the next question. Um, one second, there's another live question over here. Give me a second. Hi, sir. How are you? Hi, Hi. Um, this is sort of related to um, the question Jacob uh, asked earlier about being, you know, this, you know, this, you know, toxic positivity. I don't know, almost, almost like magical thinking that 
all I have to do is think happy thoughts and I'll, everything will be okay or get what I want. You know, you talk about being either a pessimist or an optimist and isn't there something in the middle of simply being a realist, which is what I've been trying to achieve. Like, you know, I, you know, it, it's not that I would, you know, it's not that I, you know, I try to, I try to maintain the tachon that everything would you know, ultimately is for the best. What, but sometimes things, you know, like you could look at a sick, somebody's sickness, for example, the illness, and the prognosis may not be good. But to just say that all I need to do is pray or think good thoughts, that person will get well, isn't, you know, or I'm trying to take certain actions in my private life, let's, uh, you know, financially, whatever, you know, but we, rather than just assume money is going to rain down from the sky. I mean, I know there's common sense, but but sometimes you, you're looking at something maybe realistically or analytically that I'm that I'm being told, you know, I should be more positive or you know, I should, you know, I just lack faith and I'm going, well, well no, I'm just seeing a situation as it is. And I, I don't want to, I don't want to say to sink into despair, but I we try to do something maybe about it. You know, working with the variables, but but is there something? If you say you're just trying to be more realistic, uh, is that does that sound like I'm being cynical or just like you know um, devoid of any faith? You know, um, you know, reliance on a shim. Uh, you know, you just want to not say get on with your life, but you're just, you're just doing what you're trying to do. But if you're not walking around with a happy face or something, or you know, uh, is there is there? I mean, just to say you want to be a realist or look at things, is there something wrong with that? So uh, I'll say definitely there is nothing wrong with that. But I want to give a little story that might might help a little bit. Yeah. Um, Rav Shah came to visit the Briska Rav on his uh, mm -hmm. Rosh Hashanah, and he was he was extremely sick. It was the last year of his life. Mm -hmm. And Rav Shach was uh, trying to give him uh, give him chizuk. You know, it says he told him, Have bitachan, have bitachan. So the Briskarov told him a very interesting line. Right now, oh, he didn't say this, but I'm going to use this as an example. Does anybody, I don't know where your people are located, but does anyone uh, right now have bitachan that there will not be an earthquake? Chaya, sorry, you have bitachan that won't be an earthquake. Well, so Earth, I, I I came from California. We had earthquakes. Right now, no, I know there's going to be it's some somewhere so down the road. There's somewhere where are you, where are you now? I live in Brooklyn now, but oh, I'm just Brooklyn. saying. Yeah, you know, be talking now that there won't be an earthquake. Um, I don't. I mean, I think there eventually will be. I mean, I mean whether or not I'm there, I don't know. No, right now, right now, you're sitting wherever you are right now. Do you have be talking there won't be an earthquake? No, I don't. I mean. We no. don't think about it. You don't, don't think, think about it. it. Yeah, I don't really think about it. You know. Right, right. So you don't have bitachon because bitachon doesn't mean that, you know, everything's fine. Bitachon means, the Briskarov explains, that you, you are a realist. Bitachon means you realize the danger. You're concerned about it. And now the job of relying on Hashem comes comes in. And he told the Briskarov, I'm not, I'm not concerned enough yet about Rosh Hashanah. I, I'm not ready to rely on Hashem because I'm too complacent. So the Briska Rav was telling Rav Shach that Bitachon starts with being a realist. Bitachon doesn't mean that, you know, I'm just complacent, la -di da life is good, everything's wonderful. That's not what Bitachon is. Bitachon starts when you are a realist, you realize the true, right now, uh, uh, you know, walking down the streets of Brooklyn, you you need to be talking that you're going to be safe in the streets of Brooklyn if you stop becoming a realist. You know, some people, you know, eh, fine, life's okay. It's a one-time thing. No, it's not so simple. On uh, no. Avenue N and East 18th Street, uh, there was a Palestinian woman uh, shooting uh, pepper spray and mace on, uh, on 2.30 p.m. on Shabbos afternoon. So, yeah, you got to be a realist. Ah, come on, every life is great. No, you got to be real. No, life it's, is it's not as no yeah. simple. Yeah, no, your now, world suddenly collapses like that, you know. Right. Yeah. And now you have to start arousing your bitachon. So, yeah, being being a realist is fine, but you can't be stuck there. You have to now get over it and say, hold on, but Hashem is controlling the world, and he can do anything, and 
the, the, the things that I read about in the that happened in the desert are no different today. The mun is uh the mun is um is still falling just because we don't see it. And yes, the police came and arrested the Palestinian woman, so have no fear. Okay. I hope that answered your Here, question. Here's a question somebody sent in in general. Is Betochen we, we know that we're all Mamina Bene Mamina. Now after said that, well, is this something we're born with or something we have to work on? And um, there are people out there who have uh, trouble trusting based on um, where they grew up or maybe they went through difficult challenges and they don't trust. So does it play out in their betachen? So the question is really, where do we start? Is it something that I have or I have to work on it? And then number two is what do I do if if it's hard for me to trust. Hard to trust in Hashem, hard to trust in people, hard to trust in anybody. Anybody. Right. So this is uh this might be boarding on another question, which is um when people have underlying emotional challenges, which I'm not sure that's what you're saying. So sometimes those have to be tended to first. If a person has which Lawalena you know, a lot of times children that are at risk and they don't trust Hashem is because their their whole trust system, they don't trust humanity. And therefore, their whole trust skill set has been bruised and wounded. And you have to first work on that. So there's this, you know, a lot of times before we get to the, uh, you know, religious challenge, we have to get to the emotional underpinnings and someone that's been... Uh, their their trust world has been wounded. It's it's you know that's mm -hmm. another step that has to be tended to. Um, they say again, I'm not the expert, but they say that you know Hakadosh Baruch Hu is the the dogma that you have to Hakadosh Baruch Hu is a relationship you have with your parents. And if somebody Lawalenu was 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 uh, you know traumatized by parents that you know inadvertently abused them and didn't take care of them properly, then their whole Dugma for Akadosh Baruch Hu has been wounded, so it's 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 a whole process to rebuild that that trust system. Right, and sometimes they uh, the vision, the, the the image, yeah, can yeah. be wrong. Yeah, um, we can talk about that, but let's talk about um, somebody who had a regular upbringing. Is it something you're born with, or something you have to work on? Uh, no, no, nothing that we're born with. Everything, everything you have to work on. We we might a Rav Chaskal said if anything the things that we're sort of say born into are more difficult. Rav Chaskal Levinson who was the the Bala Muna that worked on Amuna his whole life. His 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 so to say his epiphany his awakening is when he realized he was one day he he just realized that you know my tzitzis my father put on me my you know my my tzvillin they gave me my bar mitzvah you know everything I was trained into so th that's not enough. You have to now work it through. We don't, you know, anything that comes naturally. One of the reasons they say, how come we don't stand up for a pregnant lady? It says that the child is learning Kalatara Kula but from a Malach. Why don't we have to stand up every time a pregnant lady walks into the room? They say the answer is because he didn't work on it. Came Shloba Amelis. So saying you don't work on has no value. The talking is no different. Well, the... okay, let's go to the next live question you're on. Oh, hello. I, I had a question. So, yeah, you know, the Gemara in the beginning of Avot Zora says that in a Kaddish Baruch Hu Bo Betunia Ima Brios, right? Which means that Hashem doesn't give a person a challenge they can't handle. Hashem doesn't want to entrap someone. Hashem wants us to pass the test, right? Yet, unfortunately, we see in life so many people to no fault of their own are broken by their challenges. They can't pass the test no matter what, no matter how hard they try. I always have a problem reconciling this. Uh, well, well, it does. People can fail tests. The, the line is whether the line is true or not. I don't know where it says it, but let's say we accept that Hashem doesn't give you a test that you can't pass. That, but you could still fail. You know, that doesn't mean that that it's guaranteed everyone passed their test. There are people that are broken, and maybe you know. But again, we don't even. That the problem I have with that basic statement is, you know, so, someone says you can't have a. A test that you can't pass. So someone has a difficult marriage, and you can't. 
I, who, maybe, maybe the test, maybe the test is to get divorced. I, I don't know. Like I, I never understood that because what's the test? You know, maybe Hashem doesn't give you a test that you can't pass. What is passing? What is passing? So I, I, I'm not sure. I that that whole philosophy I don't fully understand. And it doesn't mean guaranteed everyone's going to pass. So yeah, there will be people that don't pass their tests. Hashem maybe gave them the ability to pass the test and they failed. So I'm not, I'm not exactly sure I understand the question. I mean, well, first, how do we interpret the Gemara in the Zara where it says, you know, in a Kaddish Baruch Hu Bob Betrunium Abrios, right? Right. That means that he gave them a fair chance. Hashem gave the Goyim a fair chance. Hashem right. they, so it means Torah Mitzvah is something that you can keep. So in a Kaddish Baruch Hu Bob Betrunium, we're not even talking about tests. It's saying if he gives you a Mitzvah to do, he's not going to come and make it difficult for, you know, he's going to give you something that you can do. He gave them the Mitzvah Sukh and it's hot outside, so they should have done it. That doesn't, but in the end of the day, they did kick the silk and they did fail their test. So in the, in that very case of Anacolors, they failed. But I, I guess when we see people who unfortunately can't continue a life, cannot, they just, you know, they're just so broken by their sorrows, they just can't move forward. Um, it, it, it just, it, it seems to, to imply that um, they were given a test that they couldn't even pass. That's what I mean to say. Maybe they are passing. Who said they're not? What well, again? What is passing? That's why I said I don't know what passing no. is. What okay. is passing? I don't know what passing is. Okay. Well, I mean, we assume if one is crushed by their sorrows and they just can't continue, that they, they you know, they're not, you know, they didn't. The question is, somebody is going through such a difficult thing. Uh, his yeah. wife died, and he lost his job, and that, and he becomes depressed. He doesn't go out of bed. So Shem gave him a test. Obviously, he can't pass. Maybe his test is to stay in bed, depressed, and and accept that. I don't know. Maybe maybe he's supposed to be. Maybe maybe that that's the test. I don't know what the test is. Maybe he wasn't able to control any of that. It was not within his emotional bandwidth. He became depressed. He's not he's not at all at fault for being depressed based on his emotional abilities. That's all he can do. And maybe that's what he's supposed to do. I don't know what he's supposed to do. That's why I say I don't know what a person's test is. About how this one said, a man that's in bed with mono. What is passing your test? Passing your test is staying in bed with mono. I don't know what that's why I keep on saying. I don't know what I can't judge passing and failing. The man's depressed. Maybe he is passing his test. Revolva writes that in one of his in one of his uh, contrasen. A person could be in a mental hospital with clinical depression and he's passing his test. He's dealing with those horrible dark thoughts and he's not committing suicide. And that's his test. So that man that you think is broken. And is after he lost his wife and his job and anything, maybe his test is not to commit suicide, and he's passing with flying colors. We don't know what to, we, we, it's not a thing to judge. You never um, know if somebody's passing, it's a fantastic test. No, he writes that the man is not committing suicide, that is passing. Do I know where his, what his biological chemical makeup is? And even the people that commit suicide. And and they, they that wasn't in their control either. I heard that from about this as well. We people that low and commit suicide are buried with people because they, they 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 didn't have control. So nobody knows what anybody's tests are, and no one knows they're passing or failing. So that again, that's why I prefaced it that, that the whole discussion for me is a hard discussion because I, I I don't know who's passing and who's failing. Okay, Rabbi Sutton, the million dollar question. You ready? Yeah. So we daven them. I'm the back I know in the safe, it has all this psukim of betachin and believing in Hashem, and we daven on somebody, you know, Hashem's in control and everything. We shouldn't fear anybody in the world, right? Everything is Hashem. How do we actually internalize this belief? We observe this situation as Israel and around the world. It can be quite unsettling. We say in davening, and we learn it many times that Hashem is in control, and we shouldn't be scared of any person or anything in the world. How can we internalize this? And also, bottom line, look what's going on. And it's scary. It's scary. So we're saying the words, we we mentally get the concept, but how do we put this into here? Okay, so one of the things is I'm actually using a screen share over here. I have this in a uh, little pamphlet that I once printed. Very important. The Chavos Olavos and Shara Bitachon says that in order to have Bitachon, you have to have seven prerequisites. And the reason why a lot of us don't have bitachon is because we don't have the hakdamas. And these are the seven hakdamas that you need to have. And um, I'm sure Coach Menachem will be more than happy to put this on his website on how you do those things. You're going to uh, send it to him an email. He'll send it out the email to everybody. Okay, I'll send it an email. 
Okay, so this is a quote straight from the Chavos of Lovas. Number one, Hashem loves us. No human being could love us like Hashem does. And you could do this if you want to be a, be a good over Hashem. You take seven days in the week and every day think about one. So number one is Hashem loves us and no human being could love us like Hashem does. It means any love I get, my mother loves me, my wife loves me, my children love me, all that feeling of love and connection, it's Hashem that created that love. They're just conduits for Hashem's love to me. Number one. Number two, Hashem keeps us in mind. He never forgets about us. He's constantly aware of all our needs, desires, and struggles. He knows exactly what's going on inside of me. Number three, Hashem carries out what He wants. Hashem can carry out anything that He wants. Nothing can stop Hashem from executing His decree. So this, it's not like he, 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 well, he, there's nothing He can't do. Number four, Hashem knows what's best for our benefit. He does not lack any information. Number five, Hashem has a track record. That means even before we were born, Hashem has already done countless acts of great kindness to us. We got through nine months of pregnancy. And he is with us throughout our entire life, continuously doing such acts. Number six, Hashem is the master of all our deeds, past and present. He has total control. Only Hashem and no one else can help or harm us. And number seven, Hashem's kindness over all things is unlimited. We don't understand and appreciate Hashem's chesed. We think, oh, I'm not worthy. I'm not deserving. Hashem's chesed is unlimited. And there's no reason why I can't get those things. And therefore, the Chavol Salava says that one of the reasons we don't have bitachon is because we don't have these seven points clear. And he spends a lot of time going through and reiterating these seven points with rias and psukim and whatever. But you can't just go, okay, I'm relying on Hashem. There's a lot of things inside of you that are going to start saying why you shouldn't rely on Hashem. You know, like all those things that come up. Maybe I don't deserve it. You're right, you don't deserve it. But Hashem's chesed is endless. Maybe that guy is going to do something. He can't do anything. Hashem's in control. You have to have all these thoughts and constantly remind you of all the things he's done till now. You made it till this stage in life, and he'll keep on taking care of you. So these are the thoughts you have to keep on working on to be Mechazer could be talking. That's one important point the Chavos Lov says is to be Mechazer, those prerequisites. You want to stop the sharing? Uh, yeah, okay. Let's go to another question over here. Menachem touched this a little bit, but I've experienced a lot of hurt from family members, particularly my parents, had a very hard upbringing. How can I reconcile the concept that Hashem is in charge and orchestrates the world with the belief that Hashem still cares for people despite the challenging life and family circumstances he created for me. So the time he says, I, how do I put the two things that Hashem does everything for good, Hashem loves me. But right when I was born, I was born to this horrible situation and my whole upbringing was terrible and I suffered so much. How could I reconcile those two things together? So this again is a hard one. I'm not a Navi, but um, what I like to use for most of these things is, you know, to create the meaning and purpose. Um, again, Coach Menachem knows a lot of therapists and I know a lot of therapists as well. Many of the great therapists had dif very difficult lives. Some of the top, top therapists had very difficult parents who, who horrific lives. And because of that, they uh, developed themselves and they're helping hundreds of people. So, you know, people sometimes become great from challenging circumstances. And if you believe that your parents can't do anything without Hashem allowing it to happen, and everything is happening exactly what you need, it's like I like to give a muscle. Um, if uh, I never took, maybe uh, not that I remember, maybe when I was a kid, but I don't remember uh, as of late taking tennis lessons. If a person takes tennis lessons and they have a poor backhand, what's the coach going to do? Coach, coaches know what to do. He's going to serve him a ball that forces him to use his backhand because that's what he needs to work on. So in life, we have to believe that a Kaddish Baruch who puts us in situations that are going to strengthen us. And a good coach knows that after the session, you want the person to be a little Charlie horse. If you start, if you're lifting weights and you get a personal trainer and you don't feel anything, he's not a good trainer. He pushes you enough that he doesn't tear your ligaments, but you're going to be Charlie Horst. 
As the famous saying goes, no pain, no gain. And I've seen many of those great people that really had challenging existences and really became great and really built their muscles, their emotional muscles because of what they went through. I know people that struggle with addiction and are helping many, many people due to their struggles. So we have to believe that a Kaddish Baruch Hu orchestrates our life to make us and put us in a position that we're going to be able to fulfill what we're here for. And another, again, you need to use Emunah uh, and Bitachon. It says that before a person comes to this world, they are shown their life and they agree to it. Before you come down here, you agree to your life. That means when you were up there, you understood why this is exactly what you needed. And you would not have gotten there without this. So this, again, takes a lot of strength and courage to, to, to be able to, uh, you know, like we said, the person that doesn't seem to see any meaning and purpose in their life. But you have to really believe that you're, you're put in a situation. I'll give you one. This is one of my favorite stories. Um, I like it. I hope uh, you like it as well. True story. My Shai was by Mordechai Schwab from Muncie. Right, right, Mordechai Schwab, they recently put out a book on him. Um, so there was a boy that had gone out for many, many years. He was like 26 years old. And let's say he went out, with, uh, I don't know, starting from 21. He went out once a month, 10 girls a year. So he went out with 50 girls already. And he goes to Shimon Schwab and he says, this is Avoidas Parach. You know, this was in the old days where, you know, when you learned in Lakewood, the girls were not in Lakewood. So you had to drive from Lakewood. You went to Brooklyn. You picked up the girl. In those days, you drove to Manhattan to some hotel lobby. And you, whatever, you spent the money and the time. And after date one, you knew it wasn't for you already. You drove it back to Borough Park. You drove back to Lakewood. You got there at 2 in the morning. You bombed out. Next morning, say, the shotgun calls you. You don't want to go out. No, you have to go out a second time. It's not nice. It goes out the second time. And he does that already 40 times, 40 times. So he comes to her, Schwab, and says, you know, tell me I'm getting married at 30. And that's it. I'll do that. But this is suffering. What's going on over here? Give me some meaning and purpose. What am I doing with my life? And her, Schwab, it was around Purim time. He says, he says, Purim's coming up. On Purim, we wear masks. He says, but really in life, everyone is wearing masks. I don't know who I am. You don't know who you are. Lamashal. Rav Schwab didn't quite say this mushal, but I'm just using this mushal to make it easier. Just so imagine Les Gilgo. You were a very tough boss, extremely tough boss. And you fired 40 secretaries. And you didn't even say goodbye to them. You had HR, human resources come in, give them the pink slip, and send them out without any benefits and without any, any um, thank you. And now you have to do good. And you have to make good to these 40 secretaries that you fired in your last Gilgal. So you come to this world now and you say, Hashem, how am I going to find these 40 girls? And Hashem says, don't worry about it. I will send you to them. I'll give you their exact addresses. And you're going to go. And you're going to take them out. And you're going to give them a drink. and Give them a nice time. You're going to go out a second time. You don't want to hurt their feelings. And that way you're going to make good on those 40 secretaries that fired last time. So we have no idea what Hashem is orchestrating, how he's pulling strings and what he's doing for us to get to exactly where we have to get and do exactly what we have to do. And you could use this. Again, I'm, I'm a Sephardi, so maybe it's Gilgul and talk more to me than to Ashkenazim. But I was once a uh, Rebbe, and uh, I was a Rebbe in, yesh in Yeshiva in eighth grade. And it was a very hard class, extremely hard class. And I, I was like, you know, I, this is what I learned in Kyle for 10 years to sit here and be a ringleader in this, this circus over here in eighth grade. And then I came up with the following idea one morning and it gave me new chiyas. I said, you know what? Maybe last Gilgal, I had these eight friends or 10 friends. How many kids were in the class? It was a small class. And I would take them to the races and gambling. And I was mavatal, you know, you know hundreds of hours of Torah from these, these 10 guys. 
And I have to come back and, and, and make good on this. I say, how am I going to find these 10 guys and, and teach them all the hours that I waste? And she says, don't worry. I'll gather them all together. I'll put them in one room. You'll split spit blood for one year teaching them. And that way you'll make up for all the bitl Torah and the time that you wasted from last guild. I said, oh, I'm doing something. I came to class with a new life. I'm accomplishing something. I'm fixing all those things they need to fix. So we have no idea why things are happening. And sometimes we might have to, uh, you know, if, you, if, you, if this works for you and be a little creative and somehow think that there's a reason, there's a, there definitely is a reason. Now, if you want to make up a reason and say, okay, you're fixing a guild, well, fine. If you don't want to make up a reason, you want to say the struggle, whatever you'd like, but there's always a reason and a purpose for what's going on. And that's part of the token, to believe. Mm -hmm. That's part of the token, to believe that there's a reason. Uh, yeah, Shem is in controlling it. Yeah. So here's an interesting question somebody sent in. Over the past decade, I faced substantial difficulties with Pranasa, struggling to cover bills, often relying on support of friends, different programs, Tampa Chavez. What is my responsibility in terms of making a living? Additionally, I've heard a, a comparison to the Mun in the base of Levi. Would you provide a detailed explanation? So he says he currently works two jobs and tries his best, but he's not making ends meet. So what does Hashem expect in terms of my Ishtadlos? And maybe take it to the next, what, what, should he take another job? Is that what Hashem wants? So what Hashem wants is, like we said before, is to cover the miracle. And like we said before about the man, the man means that Hashem will send you your Parnassah. Now, it is quite embarrassing for Tom Cheshabas to be your man. But, you know, Hashem will, will, I mean, the person is still living and being fed and supported. And he might not see a direct connection between his Hishtadlus and what's coming through. It seems like this man has two jobs. He's working hard. And that's that's all he can do. And the bridge, the, the basically actually says that when the person, uh, exhausted his ishtadless, uh you know, options, and did his best, then he's really, so to say, should feel relieved. He's doing his best. You know, a guy that says, you know, maybe I should work more. Maybe I should do more. You know, it sounds like he's already maxed out. He's doing his best. And now he has to leave the rest to, to, to a cottage Baruch. That's, you know, that's, that's where it comes in. He it's claims not it's not working out. He's like, he's like, I'm having bitachim. I'm doing my ishtadless. But Hashem is not kicking in. That's those are the four things that need chizuk. Well, you know, those are the things that need chizuk. Tvila, Torah, Derecheretz. Tvila, Torah, Derecheretz. I forgot the fourth one. Maybe it's three things. And Derecheretz, Rash is even a job. You have to, you know, sometimes stick through, stick to your job and just keep pushing and and then uh, some, somehow it will, uh, it'll, it'll, I mean, assuming that it's, uh, Within reason that you know it's it's a reasonable job that you know that 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 can bring him parnasa. So then he has to uh, stick to it and and, and uh, but sometimes they have to sometimes they have to change your mindset. If you're like you're saying Pasha Zaman, you're doing all the tefillas, you're davening, you're working, you're doing everything. At the end of the day, you feel depleted. So sometimes, like what you're saying, we're talking about having a muna betachin. You have to change the mindset, like you're like you're saying. You're doing yours, and this is what Hashem wants. Continue, believe, trust. But if he goes to sleep depleted, then how long does that last? He likes he's in pain. It's not working out. I'm giving up. What is not working out? Well, after a while, after a while, they feel it's not. It's not working out. You can't cover the bills. I'm doing all my shadows, all my tefillas, three jobs, and I still have to take out a loan. So again, those are those people that are suffering. You know, that's that's the you know the 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 person that's having his bitach and doing his shadows, whether it's the older single or the man that's suffering from medical condition, or all those great people that are doing their best and still suffering. So those are sometimes, those are the giborim that have to just keep pushing through. 
this, you know, th those are the people that we uh, don't see as the great ones. But as we said before from Avoba, those are the great ones. Believe that it's the top of it and the next level to thank Hashem and to say no matter what. Yeah. Okay, Rabbi Sutton, let's go into this. I work in a job and I really strive to excel, exceed expectations and demonstrate my worthiness and, and I, for promotions and raises. I'm really trying to impress. However, I feel sometimes like a hypocrite because we're advised not to rely on anybody else besides Hashem. How do you reconcile those two perspectives? So that's similar to the lady that asked the question before. Um, we're, you know, the Uber driver, you know, and, and his stylus and bitachan. You know, if you're, you have to do, and you have to, you have to make sure your boss likes you and do all those things. But after you do all those things, you have to realize that ultimately I'm relying on Hashem, I'm not relying on my boss. I have to do what I have to do is one thing. And what I'm thinking, Rabbi Chatzka Levinstein says, you cannot tell from the outside the difference between the Baal Boteach and the non-Baal Boteach. They're both doing the exact same thing. It's all in the mind. What are you thinking? What are you thinking when, you, when you're doing it? So, yeah, you got, you're not a hypocrite. The Hishtalus is not hypocrisy. It's, it's only when you're thinking that your Hishtalus is going to make a difference that you're in trouble. But the Hishtalus is fine. It's much harder. Much harder when you start with relying on Hashem. Yeah. That's, we talked about this a little bit before, but I want to I want to bring it up again. It's a great question. I'm a single woman approaching the age of 30, experiencing feelings of sadness and frustration towards Hashem. I find often find myself comparing myself, my life, to that of friends who come from more financially st stable or privileged family. I grapple with the belief that Hashem has orchestrated my life in a way that seems destined for failure. I'm struggling to comprehend why Hashem would put me in a place, or anyone for that matter, in a circumstance that appears to, to set the stage life for mark for hardships for challenges. So, like, like you know, the cause and effect. Like, why, like, why did Hashem do this to me? That automatically brings that here. Well, she mentioned in a little bit of you know looking at the friends, which sometimes people make this mistake. You know, I've heard this. You know, yeah, the girl that has uh, you know the wealthy father that's smart, that's attractive. And she gets married right when she comes back from seminary. And the girl doesn't have all these things, doesn't. So it almost looks like, you know, the world is in the hand of Teva. You know, if you if you have all the things going for you, then things work out. And if you don't, you're you're left to rot. So where, where's where's the bitachon? Where's, where's the hashkach? What's going on? And Rav Desla talks about this. And he says that people make a mistake. They think, oh, the guy has everything going for him. And makes a lot of money. He's smart. And his father has connections. He's making money. And I don't have that. He says it's the other way around. This man was supposed to make the money. And because he was supposed to make the money, that's why he has the father that has the money. And that's why he has the connections. But it's actually the desire that comes first. And then the, 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 the so to say, the natural things. It means this girl that had everything going for her and got married right when she came back from seminary, it's not because she had everything going for her. It's because Hashem had decided 40 days before she was conceived that she was supposed to get married at this time, and therefore he made these things happen in order to make it happen that way. But it's not like, oh, I don't have these things happening. That's why I'm in. I'm where I am. No, it's always, you always have to look at HaKadosh Baruch who's deciding it. And maybe in order to make it happen in a natural way, this person has, uh, so to say, the deck stacked against them. But that's not why they're in trouble. They're not in trouble because the deck is stacked against them. They're where they are because that's where they're supposed to be. And the way Hashem got them there was by the externals being in such a way that they're going to, it's going to cause this to happen. I hope that's clear. But there's a lot of, uh, a lot of acceptance. You have to believe and then accept, eventually be proud. But I guess it takes uh, takes time. So here's a, another question. Um, I'm dealing with anxiety. I'm actively studying the concept of Tachan. I'm learning. However, I'm finding that it's a challenge. It's very challenging for me to internalize and apply these principles in my own life. I think we could talk about this for somebody that's dealing with anxiety or for somebody that's not dealing with anxiety, just how to internalize. So maybe we could talk about both. Well, I'd like I'd like to stick to the first one because I see this a lot. Which again, this is a it, it would take um, a good hour to explain this concept, but I want to say two important points. 
Um, point number one is that anxiety is real. Anxiety is real. It's something you can see in the body. The person is anxious, their heart starts to beat faster. Their their palms start sweating. Their 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 blood is rushing faster. And what happens when a person has anxiety is as follows. I don't have to tell you, Coach Menachem, we know these things, but maybe the people that, that don't. There's a part of your brain called the amygdala. The amygdala is in charge of fight or flight. That means when there's a danger or a perceived danger, what it does when the bus is coming, you don't have to think, should I or shouldn't I run away from the bus? Because by the time you make that decision, the bus ran you over already. So therefore, Hashem and His mercy created this amygdala that excretes some cortisol that now makes your blood start rushing faster, your muscles start getting stronger, and you run. Now, when that happens, your frontal cortex, which is in charge of thinking, shuts down because you're, that's necessary for you to run. And when someone has anxiety, they're, they're not able to really uh, tap into their bitachon resources because they're shut down. Someone that is, ha is suffering from anxiety, even though it's a little bit of anxiety. I like to use the muscle. The greatest Balabi Tachan that I know, if there's a lion in the room, he's going to be scared. Unless you're Daniel or the Arachayim Rapadas, where the lion's going to eat out of your hand. If there's a lion in the room, you're jumping out the window. I don't care who you are. Now, when you have anxiety, the cat is perceived as a lion. So, so you say, oh, you'd be talking. So there's only a cat. But for him, there's a lion. So it, when a person has anxiety, it is it is um, making the challenge so much more greater than it is. And his tools are really limited. And that's why I believe that people that have anxiety challenges need to deal with their anxiety to level the playing field. Uh, I recently heard at a Tarmus Sarah convention just a few days ago, Barbara Lopiansky spoke. He said a oh, beautiful Ben Ishchai. It says, Mi sheyeshlo has besalo. And says, Ma nochol machar. He has bread in his best. Say, what am I eat tomorrow? He's considered a, a son that has a, a lack of emuna. So he asked, the Ben Ishchai asked, why does it say someone that, that doesn't have any bread today? And says, what am I eat today? Why well, says he has bread today? And says, what am I eat tomorrow? Why don't you say easy? He has no bread today. So it's because if he has no bread today and he has the pangs of hunger and all the distress that comes with it, we can't demand from him to have pitachan. He has too much mental distress and emotional distress. When you have the pas pasale, okay, and now your brain's working. And with about machar, okay, then we could say, why don't you work on your bitachan? But if you don't have pas pasale, then we can't even ask you to have bitachan. The anxiety is going to interfere with the bitachan. That's... Lesson number one. Lesson number two is, is that good, uh, Coach? That's great. Uh, lesson number two goes like this. Um, the definition, or one of the definitions of anxiety, is the inability to tolerate uncertainty. So I have a difficulty dealing with uncertainty. I want everything to be certain and clear. And people that are have a low frustration tolerance level have a difficulty with anxiety. By this uh, Tarmasara convention, there was a presenter's name was Dr. Stephen Kurtz, and he was wearing a button that said, be comfortable with being uncomfortable. It means people that have anxiety are uncomfortable being uncomfortable. That's a person that has OCD, which is an anxiety uh, disorder. So they have this uncomfortable feeling about their hands being dirty. And therefore, they have an obsession about that. And in order to calm down that un uh, that that unease, they start doing an obsession, a uh, compulsion. I'm sorry, and they'll start washing their hands to get rid of this obsessive feeling. Now, when a person has anxiety, and they're using bitachon to fight off anxiety, they're really feeding the demon, because anxiety says, "I need certainty," and now you say, "Okay, I'm going to use bitachon." to give you the assurance. It's almost like, did I lock the door? So instead of going down to check if you lock the door, like good OCD people do, you use your bitachon and say, I'm relying on Hashem, he's going to take care of me. So you're not really dealing with the problem. The problem is you're uncomfortable with being uncomfortable. 
and you're using your bitachon to be comfortable, you're really not taking care of the problem. You have to sit with that uncomfortable feeling. Of course, there's room for bitachon, but when a person has an anxiety disorder, bitachon is really backfiring because he has to get used to being uncomfortable. You think bitachon is gonna is gonna keep him comfortable? That's amazing. <laughs> no, he's gonna try to use the bitachon to make him comfortable, but it's not gonna you, work. You're worried that it might work. It's not gonna work. It's not gonna work because he's gonna keep. It's gonna keep on saying keep, I have bitachon. Yeah, yeah, he's gonna keep on having enough. He, he, he's not getting. There's always something to be uncomfortable about. You're just further reassuring and 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 avoiding the uncomfortable feel. You can't be intravenously hooked up to bitachon. You have to be able to walk outside and be calm. And if you're going to condition yourself to need the constant reassurance of bitachon without being uncomfortable, being uncomfortable, you're really not getting to the root of the problem. Could be this is a little bit uh, overkill, and it's it's uh, too much for a uh, eleven eighteen when it's really twelve eighteen. But yeah. uh, that's the point. Oh, we're just getting warmed up. Okay, you're on. Next live question. Hi, Rabbi Sutton. Thank you for being with us. I'm actually, uh, can you hear me? Am I heard? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm actually a Syrian living in Lakewood, so I, I, I go to deal every morning. So I, I see, I know firsthand we have a big connect. I see what you do on a daily basis. So we really appreciate you being here and obviously for everything you do. Um, I wanted to just quickly touch on the last thing you said. So I, I enjoyed what you just said about the anxiety bitachin, are you essentially saying that you need to deal with the anxiety first in a real way and so to speak put the bitachin on, on the back burner is that is that in general the way to go about that i'm saying you have to first be emotionally healthy before you invoke bitachin the bitachin is for emotionally healthy people bitachin is not there to deal with an emotional disorder you know just like when a person has a kidney problem, you know, what do they, they got to go to the, the hishtadlis is to go to the kidney doctor. When you have anxiety, there's hishtadlis to take care of anxiety. There is hishtadlis. There's, there's CBT therapy. There's all kind of approaches to take care of anxiety. Anxiety is a real disorder. A mental health disorder is a real disorder. And it can't be necessarily be, uh, you know, taken care of by bitach, which is not really getting to the root of the problem. Got it. Got it. Okay. And to my own question, how do I, uh, I, I'm just struggling how to ask this. How do I actually know that my bitachin is getting stronger? How do I work on bitachin in a way where I don't feel like I'm constantly just going through the same motions and the same thought process. I'm constantly approaching that same parking spot with that. Oh, it's Hashem. Oh, I'll have bitachin. But how do I actually, like you said before, you don't really know. Hashem knows if it's actually real. How do I know that I'm working on it and that I'm actually gaining from it? Because let's say I'm someone that's around 30, right? How do I, I don't really feel like I'm actually moving in the right direction. How do I work on it in a meaningful way? I guess I'm that's trying to very, ask. That's a very, very difficult question. Revolva says in his ally, sure, that there's no trait that people can fool themselves more with than with bitachon. It's extremely hard to know where you are. The Chazonish talks about this also. It means people can, the Chazonish says, sing the bitachon song when everything's going well. But then when someone opens up a store across the street with you and competing with you, all your bitachon goes down the tubes. So it's extremely hard to, to, to measure where you're holding a bitachon. I, I don't really have an answer for you to know where you're holding. You'll know where you're holding is when the challenge comes and how you do with that. And even then, you know, there are cases where, you know, you would have done miserably and because you learned about bitachon, you're doing a little bit better. So it's, it's, it's very hard to, to measure it. But what you, like you said, what can you do to strengthen your bitachon? So we mentioned before, one thing is the Chavos Olavos seven tips. There's another very important way to work on bitachon. And this is uh, goes back to Abchatzkel Levenstein. Abchatzkel uh, told his daughters when they were young girls, and he would actually, although he was an author authoritative, authoritarian type of parent, um, but he did give gifts to his daughters when they uh, did the following. 
he had what was called, he had them have a Hashkacha Pratis journal, which means every time you see Hashkacha Pratis in your life, you write it down, you journal it. And you'll you'll see as you start looking for things, you'll start finding them. You'll you'll notice how Hashem is involved in your life. And if you keep on writing them down and looking back and seeing how involved Hashem is in your life, because that's one of those seven points to strengthen your bitachon, is to see how Hashem is really looking over you and knows exactly what you need. I have a little hashkafa story that happened to me in the summertime. I've told it over a few times. I like the story. So I um, I was getting up in the summertime. It was still dark. And I had on my night table two shirts. One shirt was the shirt I was supposed to put on. The other shirt was the shirt that the day before I had spilled iced coffee right across the shirt. And um, it was dark, and I put on the shirt with the iced coffee stain on it. And so in the morning, first half of the morning, so I put my tie in, like to the side, and it covered it. The problem was that I had a meeting in Manhattan that day. I was going to this meeting, and it was quite, you know, embarrassing that I hear I have this coffee stain right across my shirt. I didn't know what to do, get a new shirt, what am I going to do? So before the meeting that I had to go to, I went to a friend's office. And the friend has a clothing company. He makes uh, he makes uh, shirts and whatever he makes. And he notices, Rabbi, look, you have a uh, you have a stain on your shirt. I said, yeah, I don't know what to do about it. He says, uh, one minute. He brought in a T-shirt, polo shirt to wear that he that he makes. And he has a design portion of his company in the back. And he has takes the shirt. And in a half an hour, he had it cleaned, pressed, and brought to me on a hanger. So I cut his brother and said, you think you need to go to the cleaner in order to have your shirt cleaned? You could sit down in your friend's office, and I'll have it cleaned right here. You don't have to clean it. I'll take care of it. And I was able to go to the meeting with a clean shirt. So those are these little stories that happen in your life. And if you keep your eyes open, they're happening to all of us all the time. Constantly, we're meeting up with people. It's endless. I could sit here and tell stories from today till tomorrow. But you'll see that if you start journaling them, they'll start happening more. And that's one of the ways to really feel that connection of Bitaha. So essentially, um, just getting back to your the, the same muscle that we keep using with the parking spot, it, you really have to work on it before you're reaching the parking spot. It's not, is there, is the feelings of when you're getting to the parking spot, I'm relying on Hashem. Does that actually add Bitachim? Is that just going through the that motion? Is or? I am relying on Hashem for the parking spot. That is a beautiful expression of Bitachim. Uh-huh. But like, to know, I guess to know it's real, because the, the ways you just mentioned were like, I guess, organic ways that make a journal or learn Chavis of others. So I, is it like a two-part process? I'm, I'm just trying to like make sense of it in my head. Is, is it dual learning plus while you're out in the trenches, also actively trying to rely on it? Is that well, is it a double you, process? Right, the more you rely, the more you're going to see it. The Rabloch Bloch writes in the Sefer that uh, an exercise is, uh, you know, when it comes to Shabbos, you know, Hashem says, spend money on Shabbos, and you'll, you'll, you'll see, you know, I'll fill it in. I've had, you know, many people tell me stories where they, you know, spent a little bit more on Shabbos, and they didn't know where it was going to come from, and then, and the next week, he got a uh, rebate from the gas company for the money they spent on Shabbos. Hashem says, you know, spend a little more on Shabbos. You can you go through the exercises. Yes, the more exercises that you do, the, the more uh, ingrained it will become. Thank you. Appreciate it. Rabbi Son, I want to jump into this one. This is a big one. I actually had a... Uh, my brother is a, is a big time of Rabbi Shai Kohn, and this is something that we got into this conversation. So this is the question. It's my question. Is talking the belief that whenever something happens to me, ultimately it's for the good, and I should simply let Hashem let it unfold? Or is that faith is that when something that I truly believe in that Hashem will give it to me, I will receive it without a doubt. For example, I desire to purchase a house or go on a luxurious vacation. I wholeheartedly trust in Betochen. Does that mean that it will actually happen? So it means, let, let me clarify the question again. Is, is there a level of Betochen, which I know the base level brings down, and I want to understand it, that if I really, really, really have a in something, even if it's something completely out of range, that I'm actually going to get it. Right. So that, that like you said, the, the base lady definitely says it. Um, many others say it. Uh, the Chazonish sounds like that might not be the case. 
or even if it is the case, the Chazonish says that there's a lower level that says that whatever's going to happen, I know is good. But like we said, that's not really bitachon because it's not really, that's more like a, a belief rather than a reliance. So this question is a complex question. I would suggest, because we put a lot of time into this one, um, uh, is actually, if you get this safer and you go to page 98, um, there's a famous story brought down there. And I actually heard the story from uh, one of the base of Levy's great grandchildren that he heard from the base of Levy's great grandson that heard it from the Briskarov that um, the story that um, from Yisrael Salanter was sitting with the Rishash, the famous Rishash on the back of the Gemara, Rishul Shash Drashon. And um, they were discussing this very point. Rishul insisted that we would be tough and one could obtain anything he wants. While the Rishash argued that it's not so. To prove his point, Rabbi Saul said that I'd be tough to receive a gold watch. At that moment, there was a knock on the door and a man walked in and handed his watch to Rabbi Saul. Okay? So, the Rabbi Moshe Feinstein in Kol Ram and Shmos says he was upset at those who published a recount of the story about Rabbi Saul that it reflects an inaccurate perspective on Mitachan. And he told others that the episode did not happen. Okay, so Ramosha wasn't happy, and some say Ramosha. This I heard from one of his Talmudim that when he disagreed with something, rather than say he disagreed, he would say it didn't happen. Like a certain Ramban he disagreed with, he said it was a total sulfur. And there are those that explain that Ramosha believed they didn't like publicizing it because it's dangerous. There are people, like we said, from Avolba that really don't have bitachon, and it's an excuse to say, okay, you know what, I don't have to go to work anymore. I don't have to do anything. I rely on Hashem. It's gonna it's just gonna come to me, and 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 also, what happens is that people don't who really don't have bitachon. They think they have bitachon. They don't get what they want. They say, "Hey, look, bitachon doesn't work." So it really gives a bad rep for bitachon when people, uh, like we said, no one knows who does and who doesn't. And you know, like they get up and they say, "Oh, this man was a great bal bitachon." They say by his levaya he believed to the end, and then he dies. That's not good rep for bitachon, you know. So, so if we if we tell people that if you rely on Hashem, it's gonna work, and then I rely on Hashem, it didn't work. So, what does that mean? Bitachon's a fake; it doesn't work. So that's that's why there are many that believe that pushing this approach publicly is dangerous because if the person doesn't really have bitachon and it doesn't work, it's really giving a bad rep for bitachon. Okay. The follow up question on that is: If talk is true, Lamaisa. If you really want something that's bad, how, and then how could you like? If you're gonna have real betachin that you should get it, and you want to have a hundred million dollars, well, I see you know it's bad for you. So right, I right. give it to you if it's bad for you. That's the follow up question. Okay, that's a great question. Rav Bluff discusses in the safer, and he says, let's say he gives the marshal, I have betachin, then I get this. Uh, I'm gonna get that bottle of. I want to have. want to have that soda, and the soda has poison inside of it. So now, how could you be talking saying I'm gonna get the soda? He says, your tachan is to get good, healthy soda. That was your bitachan. So Kaddish Baruch is going to turn into good, healthy soda. You're not going to get the poisonous soda. He's going to make it good. That's what you wanted. You didn't want poisonous soda. You wanted good soda. So he'll make it good for you. So now, another question is, uh, you know, before we finish, is it something that we, is it like all or nothing, bitachan? Somebody has a little bit of betachin because, you know, he's not, he doesn't have it fully, so that's not going to happen. Uh, so, that there, you're right, there is no all or nothing. You know, there is no all or nothing. Uh, the, the little, whatever you have, you get rewarded for, that's for sure. And as much as you rely on Hashem, like they give the muscle, you know, with, 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 with reliance, you know, if uh, Coach Menachem, you say, you'd like to borrow $100 from me. I'll lend it to you. You want to borrow $1,000 to you? Probably I'll give it to you. $10,000? No. What do you mean? Do I rely? Do I trust you? Don't I trust you? So the answer is to a point. You know, to a point. Okay, I want to ask this question. How do I place my Mimuna B'Tachan Hashem when I feel like I'm undeserving, whether I'm not from, I'm not doing the right things. I feel like I'm not worthy. So how do I, how do I have B'Tachan if I'm not in a good place? So we go back to the Chavos Lavavos that says that Hashem's chesed is endless and you're not getting because you deserve it. It says, And the Medrash says, 
The, the bitachon is not about, you're not getting, when you rely on Hashem, you're not getting because you deserve it. You're getting because Hashem says, rely on me. And that's why you're getting it. The schus that you're getting it is bitachon. Not because of anything you did. The reliance on itself is a reason to get it. So regardless of who you are, reliance will bring it about. One of the seven uh, seven beliefs. Yes. Okay, okay. so basically, we have to do a shtadlis. Sure. We have to do a shtadlis to cover it up. And then we somebody asked the question, uh, how do I know if I did enough shtadlis or not? But uh, what's if somebody wants to be in the, the highest madriga? No shtadlis at all. Uh, more let, let me let me emphasize yeah, the question. It's not like he doesn't want to do any shtadlis at all. It's more like Hashem is best, base, basically the king of the world. Hashem controls everything. My so I should do any shtadlis, right? He makes uh, all the decisions. We dab Rosh Hashanah. Right. The, the Sefer, the Sefer, the Sefer Nechtev, it's written, it's written. And right. we should dab Rosh Hashanah very hard. Go home and drink a coffee. All right. The answer is that there's an onish called B'zeya Sefecha Tol Halacha. So you got to work. That's that's the that's the base of Levi's answer to that question. Is B'zeya Sefecha Tol Halacha. You got to work. And he also says that if you wouldn't work, you'd get into trouble. So Hashem created work to keep you out of trouble. You know, that says, Tov Tarm Derech Eretz, Yegi Yishnei Mishkach Asavan. If you're not going to be busy, you're going to get into trouble. So in the Chanam, if you have somebody that could could fill his day with learning and not get into trouble in a Hanami. But most people are not like that. Most people need to be busy. So Hashem gave us work to keep us out of trouble. So you can't, you know, it's not, you can't just say, I want to be on the highest level. That's not so simple. And even the one that's on the highest level, it's not highest level doesn't mean you sit back and doing nothing. That's why the last piece of the base of lady, beautifully ends with the last piece ends with, um, don't think if you have be tough, you can you, you can take the easy life. You gotta have a malus anyway. You're gonna be amal batari, you're gonna be amal at work. Be is not an excuse for hard work. That's again a volbus. A lot of people are just lazy. They, okay, be So I'll, you know, I could be lazy now. No, be is not an excuse for laziness. Okay, go well, Let's go to closing. First of all, Grace Yishkoi for David Sutton coming on tonight. Tremendous chizik. We really need to work on Amur Batakhan. That's that's probably the most important thing that we could do right now, especially in the times that we're dealing with. And Mitchem, all the hundreds of thousands of people, the hundreds of people that were here tonight, the thousands of people that will listen to it over the next while should be a schus for you, Rabbi Sutton, for everybody for Klai Israel. And again, if anybody's here the first time, every Sunday night at 9:30 on the Zoom ID, we have different shirim, different topics, different rabbanim. Mitchem next week, November 12th. We're gonna have a deep session with the world famous Mashpia. We're originally from five towns, the Talmud of Moshe Weinberger, of Yossi Zakatinsky, Rabbi Joey Rosenfeld, who lives in Israel now. The topic is the redemption of trauma and the trauma of redemption. What Panimus Atari can teach us about chaos and fixing it. It's going to be a powerful and deep, meaningful program. Come, join, be part of it, let people know about it. Again, everything's recorded at www.menachemburnfield.com. If anybody has any questions, you can email coachmenachem at gmail.com. Tonight's share is 163. And if you want to listen to this recording, any other recording, you can listen to the phone lines at 848. 777 grow that's 848 grow thank you to all the advertising sponsors the lakewood school five uh five town central and Chayla kaufman and i'm gonna go to closing and then coach menachem and then rabbi sutton after two hours we need a starker closing of chizik so i just want to say um i feel like this year is a very important year we, we've definitely done a lot of shiurim on moon and tonight we really covered a lot and you know it's something that we need to constantly be in on and, um, you know, it's when we get shaken up, especially what's going on now in Israel and in the whole world, really, not in Israel, it's like a, it's a wake up call. It's like Hashem wants us to connect him and he wants us to have the moon and Batach and I really feel close to him and not be busy with what Biden said or this one said or that one said. It's really that that belief and that strength. So the more we could work on our moon and Batach and the more we could trust in Hashem and make him part of our lives. And hopefully this year, hopefully catapults that, that I think it's a big success for us and for Klai Israel. And Rabbi Sutton, I really appreciate you coming on. Coach Benachem. Yeah, thank you so much. We covered a lot. And um, I guess we have to buy the safer to uh, see what else it says, you know, and to actually put into practice. But just an idea, like we discussed, to work on Betachem is uh, don't wait till the challenge comes up. 
start thanking Hashem, seeing the Ashgach of Ratus, and like we heard, to journal. And that's where we find the connection. So that when we do have a challenge and when things are not working exactly the way we want, so we can go to our father and just like just rely on him after we've done the shtadlis to rely on him. And uh, hopefully then it's a little bit easier because when we're struggling, it's hard, like we heard. So struggling, whether it's panasa or health, sometimes it can be hard to, to connect. So for an example that I mentioned is the war, you know, with all the rackets, we heard we heard it on, on the share, with all the rackets, Bar Hashem, the Hashem is taking care of us and protecting us. It's it, we forget about it. We, we're so used to it. We're like, okay, let them shoot the rockets, big deal, it's not a problem for us. Like every rocket is like is, is Yad Hashem. Is, Hashem is protecting us. Hashem should protect us. Protect all the chayalim, protect us all, and amidst Hashem, we should only hear good things, and we should be machazik ourselves in Mun Vatachan. Like we heard, that's our avoid now, and that's part of our chuba process to get closer to Hashem. Shkoyach. We're there for two hours. Give Thank us you the very much. Give us the brichizik before you leave. The brichizik before I leave. So I just want to read a little bit from the base of Levi, where he says, when someone else is attacking us, he says, Yavin ki akol mi'ita yizbarach. Everything's from Hashem. Ve'ena odem ahu rak hashevet asher bomanish lachayal. And that person is just a stick. And he brings a pasuk. Hoi ashur shevet api. Woe, ashur is just a stick of my wrath. And therefore he says, if a person is mishan and l'rodfo, if you start begging the one that's chasing you, it's like someone that's being hit. He's talking to the stick. And he says, Aram Mikedem. Aram was coming from the east. And the Philistines were from the west. They consumed Klai Yisrael with every mouth. And it ends off, They didn't return to the one that was hitting them. And they did not search out Hashem. So what the Beis HaLevi is telling us, when things go wrong, people make a mistake and they're talking to the stick. And you have to talk to the one that's holding the stick. And talking to the stick is not going to help us. And we have to understand that. That what's going on now, whatever's going on, they're all sticks. And we have to talk to the one that's holding the stick. That's a Kaddish Baruch Hu. And we can't get uh, distracted by everything else is going around and going on. Wow. Beautiful, Robert son. Thank you so much again for coming on for the Chizik. Again, Met Shem, we'll see everybody same time, same place next week, November 12th, with Rabbi Joey Roosevelt. Everybody have a great night, and thank you for coming, and hopefully take some of these words tonight and you grow closer to Hashem. Thank you again. Uh,